So welcome everybody to Angular Contributor Days. I uh, was so excited to collaborate with Minko on kind of putting this together. So uh, really excited about doing this and hope, hope to do another one this year. This event is presented by the Angular team and the Stop Media. And, you know, again, thank you so much, Angular team, for supporting and joining and being willing to be a part of this conversation. Miko, I don't know if you wanted to say anything. Yeah, I just wanted to welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining today to discuss all these topics that we have on the agenda on how to make Angular better. Yeah, it's just really, really, really good to see everybody. Um, I wanted to thank, thank this dot labs, you know, without Hot Labs couldn't be doing all these really cool, fun things. We are hiring. I feel like I'm a broken record because uh, we keep hiring and keep hiring and keep hiring. So we have two amazing new team members starting, um, but we are hiring like two or three more. So if you know anybody, let us know. We have a lot of really amazing panelists today as well. Uh, myself and Colm from this dot will be kind of helping moderate, et cetera. You can always ping us in the private chat if you like. And then on the um, on the Angular side, Minko, and probably a little bit of Steven as well. So um, yeah, just like a lot of really amazing people joining and really welcome and open um, conversation during this time. the agenda. Really first things first right now, we'll talk about just making sure you're following the Angular Code of Conduct. Um, and if other people are not following Angular Code of Conduct during the event, feel free to again ping one of us four and we'll make sure to take care of it. I don't know if Mika, you had anything else to say about Code of Conduct. This sounds good. Yeah, we're under the Angular Code of Conduct, so please be nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, um, Angular Contributor Days is just a place, again, we, we've done this in the past before, and uh, we've done it in person at ng-conf, we've done it um, online as well in different formats, but the reason why I, f I feel like this event is so amazing is because it just brings together a bunch of really amazing people. You all are so amazing, and uh, really allows us to like share and open conversations um, about stuff going on in Angular. And it's something that, you know, I did this a few months ago with GraphQL and it's like, we don't have those places to gather anymore, right? Where we're having such amazing conversations. So that's why I'm so excited about this event. Um, agenda, Angular team intro. Uh, we'll talk about Angular updates, Angular roadmap. We'll do a bio break as well. Then we'll get into a few topics like state management, best practices, server side rendering, pre-rendering, Bio break again, extending Angular, and then open discussion time. Um, Minko, did you have any comments about the agenda? Uh, so yeah, we're going to try to keep it mostly bi-directional. We have only a few things where we, we just want to share a couple of updates with, uh, with, with folks on what improvements we did in framework, tooling, components, and also um, in uh, working towards better communicating what we have been up to and getting feedback on major initiatives. But generally, I'm hoping us to get a very like active conversation from anyone uh, on the individual topics, especially when we start discussing um, extending Angular, our server-side rendering, and state management practices. Now, Minko, for the Angular team intro, was that oh, was that what you wanted me to share? No, actually, yeah. Here we can just uh, like go ahead and actually it might be even better if we start with do you think we're gonna have enough time to go through like everybody um and try let's do that okay. <laughs> keep it to like just... maybe five five seconds everyone right okay <laughs> i'm gonna start i'm minko i'm working on angular at google I'm Colm, I'm working on Angular with Lizard Labs. So we should have some order, I guess. Uh, okay, I can nominate people. <laughs> Sander, do you want to go? Sure. Hi, I'm Sander. 
Uh, I'm a long time Angular user and GDE. Um, I'm working on Scully most of my time. So I might have something to chime in in the SSR portion. Tracy, you're actually next on my grid. You introduce yourself, but you want to do it again? I'm Tracy. I'm one of the co founders of uh, the Set Labs. I'm also Angular, GDE, Microsoft MVP, and on the ArxJS core team. Manfred. Yeah, I'm Manfred Steyer. I'm part of the GTE program, and I'm doing a lot of consultancy and trainings for Angular. One of my main topics is Angular for huge enterprise scale applications. Jules, you're next on my screen. Hi, I'm Jules. <clears throat> I'm an engine manager at uh, Google, and I work on Angular 2. Not Angular 2, but Angular Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Alyssa. Hi, hopefully you can hear me. I'm an Angular developer advocate at Progress, a GDE, and um, the front end lover all around. Pete. Hi, I work on the Angular team, uh, mostly with stuff that you shouldn't ever have to notice. And if you do, then there's a problem. Well, Sim, you're next. Hi, um, I'm Wasim. Um, uh, I work at Microsoft. Uh, I'm an uh, Angular advocate at heart. I'm also part of the GDE program. And a, uh, yeah. Pablo? Hey, uh, so I, I'm kind of wearing two hats because on one hand, I w I'm messing with Angular. Uh, so like recently working on IBM performance, but also using Angular in my company and supporting other people uh, using Angular. So like. Kind of dog pudding. <laughs> Mark. Hey everyone, I'm Mark. I'm on the Angular team here at Google, and I really love parenting. That's sarcastic, by the way. <laughs> Michael. Um, Michael Prentice here. Uh, I'm half time, kind of like Pavel, half time on the Angular team, half time on my own. Uh, projects with DevIntent, uh, doing consulting, so uh, both uh, using Angular and helping to build uh, mostly on the component side. Steve. I'm going to assume you mean me, but saying Dave can be dangerous because there can be many. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm Dave. I also work for Google. I write docs. I try to write a lot of docs. Emma, you're next. Hi, yeah, I'm Emma. I also work on developer relations for Angular at Google. James? Hey there, everybody. I'm James Daniels. I sit with the Firebase team at Google, and y'all probably know me because I'm the lead on Angular Fire. Jessica? Hi everybody, I'm Jessica. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, I work on the Angular team at Google. And Maxim. Hello from Norway, folks. Uh, Maxim Salnikov, DevRel in uh, Microsoft, uh, Google developer expert in Angular, organizer of NG Vikings conference and NG community gathering. Natalia. Hi, I'm Natalia. I'm a Google developer expert also in web technologies and I work as a solutions architect also a lot with Angular in Enterprise. Tanimira, you're next. I have no clue if you can hear me, but my name is yeah. Tanimira. I work at Perfect, Perfect. VMware on a library called Quarity that's used by lots of Angular developers internally and externally. And I previously worked on NativeScript. Tara. Hi, I'm Tara Minixik. Um, I do developer experience uh, engineering at Netlify. I mostly focus on Angular, doing trying to get the full stack um, Jamstack story for Angular in particular, uh, which is a lot of bringing in kind of serverless Angular and focusing on serverless functions 
the deployment process for pre-rendering and all that fun stuff to uh, get the deployment easy and get faster load times with caching and such. So, yeah. Yeah, we should chat about this during contributor days. <laughs> we have an agenda item for server-side rendering, so I'm looking forward to this. Aristides. Hello, all. Uh, I'm Aristides. You can call me Aris. I'm from Greece, Athens, and I work as a front-end web developer in a company here. I'm also a co-organizer of the Angular Athens Meetup and Angular GD, and I'm the author also of, of a book about Angular, which is called Learning Angular Third Edition. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm looking forward for all the talks. Thanks. Jeremy. Oh, you're muted. Oh, I can't hear you, unfortunately. You're not muted. Yeah, you're not muted, you're just silent. I can take Jeremy's intro. So Jeremy <laughs> is working on the Angular team. He's leading framework and components. He's the technical lead there. Uh, Andy. You I fixed it. Oh, okay. Jeremy fixed it. Can you, do you want to try again or are you happy with my intro? Okay, he didn't fix it. Andy, do you want to go next? And you're muted, by the way. There we go. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Fidelity. I've been using Angular for a while, but this is my first Angular meetup. Given? There's a, a five or six percent chance you can hear me. Uh, but my name is Stephen Fluen. I am uh, developer relations on Angular at Google. Craig? There me. Hi, um, I'm Craig, um, engineer at Spotify, uh, GDE. Um, yeah, hi, I'm sleepy. <laughs> um. Is that me again? Sorry, go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Alan, and I'm from the Angular Tooling team. Cindy, you're next. Hi, everybody, hi, I'm, everybody. Cindy. I'm Cindy. <laughs> and I work on the <laughs> Angular team as a program manager. And uh, Michael. Callahan is next on my grid. You're looking for me? Yes. Hi, I'm Mike Callahan. I consider myself an Angular advocate. I am uh, a lead software engineer at uh, Disney Parks. Adam Plummer. So my webcam is giving me a couple issues. I'm going to restart it for later. But hi, my name is Adam Plumer. Um, I am the I'm one of the maintainers on Angular Universal along with Alan, and I also maintain Angular Flex IO. Robert. My name is Robert. I'm from Germany, and I'm co-organizer of Angie Girls. All right, so just heads up that my grid got absolutely like shuffled and everyone is in a different order right now. Um, I will go with Artem. Hello guys. Uh, yeah, just a developer uh, that is interested in using uh, Angular a lot for our projects. Glad to see you all. Balash. Or Balash? I'm sorry, I'm not sure about with the right pronunciation. Tapai? Balash Tapai? Oh, you can't talk, no worries. Uh, Brugger? No? Okay. Uh, we can go to Matthew. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm from Northern Ireland, uh, and I'm a full-stack developer. Uh, transitioned into Angular a couple of years ago. Uh, 
Um, so I hope to learn more. Corbin. Hi, this is Corbin. Uh, I'm an Angular developer at uh, Workspan. Sheriff. Sheriff, second time? No? Okay. Hey, guys. Um, oh, yeah. brought, my name is Sharif. Uh, I'm a software, software developer with uh, Blue Shield of California. Uh, I'm looking forward to know more about um, Angular. I'm just trying to choose my framework here. Uh, we're, we're working on different technologies um, at Blue Shield, but um, I'm, um, I, I want to decide on a framework, whether it's um, React or Angular. Hope um, I can get answers soon. Okay, uh, cool. Deborah? Hey, um, I'm Deborah Carrada. I do, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. One box yeah. says my microphone was muted, another box said it wasn't. Um, I do uh, consulting work and I also do Pluralsight courses. I have several Angular courses on Pluralsight that I'm working to update to 11.1, yay. And Juliano. Hi, I'm from Brazil. I work for Ireland remotely as an Angular developer at a company called Zeit. Great to be here. No, we collaborate with Zeit. We have been working on uh, ng deploy implementation with, with you. Or am I thinking about different Zeits? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, the company was called Scraping Hub, and it just switched the name for Zeit on Monday. Oh, I see. And Zeit switched to Vercel. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> Oleg? Oleg, you're next. Guys, my name is Oleg. Uh, I am from Akio Labs, Moscow. Yeah, just to work on different front-end technologies, particularly Angular. Uh, yeah, nice to see you all. Thank you for joining. So I'm very sorry if I have missed someone. Uh, my grid got shuffled a couple of times. Uh, if uh, I have not called your name, please feel free to introduce yourself. Now is the time. Yeah, hey guys, uh, this is Shubham here. Uh, I'm from India and I'm a full stack developer at Cognizant. I've been working with Angular since past year. And fun fact, actually I learned Angular from Deborah Kurata from her courses on Pural site. So, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm the other Craig on the call. Uh, I'm a developer at iGrewWeb um, and I've been using Angular um, in Ionic for the last couple of years. All right, I think, is that everybody? I think, I yeah, think this yeah, is great. Go ahead, please. Hey, uh, this is Pavan. Uh, I work at uh, NCI, National Cancer Institute. I work as a full stack developer. So by my application, I am using Angular. I'm using Angular 11.1 now. Oh, that's great. You're on the edge right now with the latest features. Yeah. Nice. Uh, if that's everybody, I, I can. I guess Tracy, we can go to the next step. Uh, is it in your updates? Good. Yes. Let me see if does that work. Can you see your? Perfect. Light? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Oops. Okay. So we're going to spend most of the time today to just having a discussion on state management, like different technical topics, and generally on how what we can do in order to communicate uh, what we have been up to better and uh, how we can jointly collaborate on improving the entire framework and the entire platform that we have been working on. And in the next about 10 minutes, I just want to share a couple of updates with you on both the technical and the community side of things. Um, and I'm going to keep it really short. So next slide, please. So we're going to be talking about Angular framework, about updating our tooling infrastructure, components, and a little bit on what we have been doing in order to get more feedback and also communicate our projects and new features that we have been working on. 
Next slide, please. First of all, can you believe that we released Ivy in 2020? I feel like this happened a couple of years ago now, but it literally just happened right before the pandemic. Next slide, please. Yes, I wanted you to see the emoji, how, how uh, shocked I was. Uh, with Ivy, we spent a lot of time on making sure that folks are getting backward compatible experience, while at the same time, we were able to provide some improvements on top of the development ex experience and uh, build times, for example, performance and tooling infrastructure. One of the biggest releases after Ivy is our experimental uh, release of the Ivy language service. So the language service is based entirely on the Ivy compiler, which means that you'll be getting more consistent error messages in your text editor and ID and your console. Yeah, it's the next slide. And uh, at the same time, you'll be also getting the type, the power of TypeScript in your templates as well. So you'll be getting strict no checks, you'll be getting much more accurate type inference and auto completion. You can actually enable the IV experimental support in the language service today. Just make sure, make sure you have installed the VS Code extension and you go to settings and click on the checkbox. In fact, we have a video in the Angular YouTube channel where Mark is uh, explaining how you can do that in details. Next slide, please. We also worked on much better error messages. So this is one of the features that I'm really excited about because it really makes the barrier of entry much lower. Now, when you get an error together with the message itself, you're also going to get a URL, which contains a unique code. When you follow this URL, you're going to get redirected to angular.io, where you're going to find a guide on how you can fix this error and what this error actually means. This guide also includes a video, which we recorded in collaboration with Fireship. Next slide. Localization. So uh, Pete mentioned that he has been working on such things that you shouldn't really notice. And if you notice, that's going to be a problem. Well, one of the things that you may notice is that when you have multi-language support in your Angular application, your builds probably got much faster, way faster. Previously, we used to build uh, the your application for each individual language you support. But now we switch to a different method where we're building your application only once and right after that, in order to produce different outputs for different languages, we're just doing some string manipulations, which makes things much smoother and faster. Uh, and still this comes with zero runtime costs. We're appreciating translation files. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy uh, with this update. This was one of my highlights in the post ID uh, development. Uh, next slide, please. So together with Ivy, we want to clearly keep it backward compatible. We want to make sure that all the existing Vue Engine libraries are functioning with your Ivy applications as well. So we came up with the Ivy compatibility compiler that compiles Vue Engine libraries to Ivy format. And it worked well. We had actually a CI which was uh, running builds of Angular Ivy applications with the top, I believe, over 180 libraries or so. And uh, most of them were compiling without any issues, but still this was adding some extra build time, especially after post install. So something we worked on together with community with our first RFC is the ID library compilation and distribution. We released our preview of the ID library compilation with the uh, Angular linker in version 11.1. .1, so you can actually give it a try right now. Just keep in mind that we're still not recommending distribution of IV code on NPM. We're still recommending Vue Engine, so please don't make any changes. When the time comes, we're going to automatically migrate everyone to the recommended practice. Next slide. And some updates on tooling. Yeah, next slide. So with the CLI and Universal, we did a couple of exciting things. Probably the the most well accepted feature was hot module replacement, where now when you're developing your applications in dev mode, you're going to be able to preserve the state of your forms, let's say, and you'll be getting much faster updates. We're not going to refresh your page when you change source code, but instead we're going to patch your application and re-render it. Also, we're considering, we have been also uh, very excited to like uh, pushing towards enabling best practices from the very start. And this is what we are going to try to do with um, strict mode as well. 
So strict mode, it currently appears as a prompt. You can consider whether you want to enable stricter type checking and performance budgets in your Angular CLI applications, but we didn't enable it by default because we didn't know how this is going to impact the user journey. At the same time, we noticed that about 70% of people have been opting into strict mode. So we're considering enabling, fast, enabling stricter type checking in version 12. Performance improvements, this is something that we have been working on in collaboration with Google Chrome. They have been pushing different initiatives on how you can optimize different applications for Core Web Vitals. And as part of this collaboration, we worked on inlining of fonts and critical CSS. Critical CSS inlining just removes render blocking resources for client-side rendered, server-side rendered applications, pre-rendered, and including app shell as well. Something which we very silently shipped as version 11.1 was hybrid rendering. So now Universo is smart enough to know when you have pre-rendered pages for the individual routes so that it can return the pre-rendered content instead of server-side rendering them. You, this was possible to do even in the past, but now it is just working out of the box. Yeah, next slide, please. Two of the biggest updates in components are harnesses and MDC web. So harnesses, this is a way for you to interact with your uh, components, with all your Angular material components without actually coupling to their internal structure. They're especially useful in test environments for units and end-to-end -end testing. With MDC web, we want to introduce some primitives from MDC web so that we can have better, more accessible, and more consistent material design components in Angular. Next slide, please. And all across the board, we have been improving the Angular documentation. Dave from the docs team, he can share much more uh, during the next couple of hours, but we have been investing a lot in our introductionary content, and now uh, there is a plan for improving the learning journey for more advanced concepts, such as change detection, content projection, zones, and so on, so on and so forth. Next slide, please. Yeah, and let, let me spend just uh, two minutes talking about some improvements we did in our communication. Uh, next slide, please. So the roadmap, uh, just, uh, well, maybe list of projects doesn't sound like a huge step forward, but that's really tricky, in fact. We have been moving forward with the web standards and we have been building stuff that has never been built before. So it is really tricky to commit to some specific set of goals when you don't know where the web is going to be two years from now. But I think we found a really good balance. So you can read more about this in our blog post, uh, in the blog post by Jules on uh, the roadmap for Angular, where we list, listed a couple of major efforts that will be focused on in the next couple of months and years on making Angular better. You can find it on angular.io slash guide slash roadmap. And also we want to involve the community more in large initiatives, such as, let's say, Ivy library distribution or research inlining. So as part of the major efforts that we'll be moving forward with, we're going to be sharing RFCs so that anyone can join the discussion, provide us feedback and help us make Angular better. Next, yeah, uh, the developer survey. Well, I added it in order to like thank to anyone everyone who gave us this a lot of valuable feedback. In the developer survey, we got close to 30,000 responses. And I was very happy to see that over 52% of people rated Angular with 10 or a nine out of 10. And I think less than 6% gave us a score below five, which is pretty happy to see. Like I was pretty happy to see that. Uh, at the same time, we got a huge amounts of open-ended answers, which took us a while to analyze. So we went through some uh, categorization of the open-ended answers. We were able to bucket them into different categories to see where people would want to see improvements in Angular in general. And this is how we, we made a lot of important decisions as part of our roadmap. Next, please. Yeah, so one of the things that we noticed was that folks wanted more content, more tutorials, and more uh, videos on generally how they can use the new features in Angular. Mark has been 
revamping our YouTube channel with a lot of great content. So make sure that you're following our YouTube channel, uh, Dangerous YouTube channel, with uh, latest videos coming from us. We have been also uh, running a lot of uh, different campaigns on Twitter so that we can share what's new in Angular and share some of the cool community projects as well as uh, different large organizations and Google projects using Angular. So make sure you follow us on Twitter and we have been doing the same in our blog as well with a lot of technical content and a lot of product announcements. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is, in fact, the most, uh, let's say, the, one of the biggest investments of the team. We had operation backlog where uh, the Angular framework team, tooling, and components spent up to 50% of their time in triaging issues and also resolving pull requests. So since uh, mid last year, we were able to resolve about 300 pull requests and the majority of them went in based on some calculations with it. So this has been a lot of uh, effort and we're happy to see that so many people were willing to contribute to the framework and their work went into the repository. Uh, we were, were thinking, we we're uh, doing different plans on how we can streamline this effort even further so that we can provide more rapid feedback and introduce, includes the community in the decision-making process on merging individual features. Next slide, please. So yeah, that was pretty much actually everything for me. Uh, these are some of the updates and I'm hoping that we can use some of them to kick off the discussion from here. I think um, our first discussion point is well, you actually went pretty fast. Um, <laughs> but I think um, also, do we have anything else? We have about 15 minutes left on this portion, maybe 10 minutes left on this portion before we do a bio break. We can, uh, yeah, Pete actually, uh, he just mentioned that we resolved many more pull requests. Uh, he can share more details. He can maybe talk a little bit more about this. Oh, well, I was just, uh wanted to say that the, the graph is actually slightly conservative because that shows the number of open pull requests. But you can imagine that during that period when we were closing all of those ones off and resolving them, lots of them were coming in as well. So I think, I can't remember what the detail were, we did a little computation at one point, but I think we were closing like hundreds, like and not closing, like just throwing them away, but resolving them, merging them. Um, I think we got through like seven or 800 during, during the autumn. Um, um, and this is only for the framework repo. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 There is also components and uh, UI. And I think a, a lot of these, the pull requests now are being turned around in a much shorter space of time. Um, we're working through them in like matters of days rather than months. And so hopefully this is helpful to the community. Um, and um, will actually uh, give people more confidence to submit contributions to the team. Uh, something we noticed was that VS Code were doing really well in handling feature requests. They have an automated process where they keep the uh, feature request open for a certain amount of time so that it can collect uh, votes from from the community and based on the number of votes they were deciding whether this is something worth pursuing or uh not at this point so this is something tempting i'll be i'll be curious to hear uh thoughts of people here does anyone feel strongly about this process or has experience with it Okay, so people love it. <laughs> I think so far also... everyone's considering the the plus the thumbs up in GitHub as kind of their votes right now. So we we sort of have a system like that, but it's maybe not as formal. I was going to say we should also recognize the work that Pavel did over the summer to um, help us 
with the uh, original getting on top of the backlog of all the many thousands of issues that had uh, accrued while we were getting through Ivy over the previous year. Um, that was just terrifying to look at and uh, it really took a lot of effort to start to structure how we were going to work through those and break them down into the groups that we could then start to um, uh, address. Yeah, coming back to the to the voting system, I, I think like I, I've seen this working in the other framework in the past. Like I, I think like like completely not in JavaScript, but like a Spring framework. I think that they kind of in the past they pushed this idea of we are going to uh, like take votes from the community to, to the extreme, in the sense that like they always were taking like the, like n top voted and addressing and like it obviously addressing doesn't mean like oh we are going to implement this or like merge this pull request. But we are going to at least like oh maybe that that's the highest voted thing but like we for example we don't know how to do it now or like this is actually linked to some other thing that we should do so uh, so I think like if we, if we go with this voting system we should also communicate what what the vote means like right like it's yeah I think I saw it for the first time in uh, Lodash. they were closing feature requests and adding them a vote needed label and from there they were making decisions based on the number of collected votes and the bandwidth they have yeah so, yeah. so, so I think so we, we I should think interpret it this, this like uh, there is interest in this particular thing and then like still see how it fits in the entire framework ecosystem. Minko, you are disappearing. Like, yeah, I saw completely. That. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Superpowers. Like in Back to the Future, you know. And I cannot reproduce it. I was just moving my laptop around. This is cool. I've got one more update community facing. Um, we just landed a huge bit of work uh, from Stephanie and George uh, to improve both readability and accessibility on our docs. So Angular IO, it used to go like four or 500 characters across the screen, as big as your you know, machine was. And most people, you know, about 90 characters width is what's best for reading. And so now all the pages will be, you know, that size and be much more readable. And a number of other styles were changed just to make the whole docs experience much better. Uh, Dave, do you want to share some updates about uh, what is planned in the documentation? No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I want to. I, I just want to plus one, Michael's. Uh, uh, I'm so happy with the uh, the way the docs look now. It feels a lot less overwhelming when I read it, and I look at them all the time. Um, the yeah, so we've been working uh, up until this point on improving the getting started experience. So that's been a lot of work, both uh, targeting how we uh, the navigation and how we kind of organize the docs and as well as how we present information to people reading about it. And one of the things that I've been working on is making sure we, we target specific audiences and we have those audiences defined, right? Someone who is familiar with, uh, you know, with, you know, front end development, but doesn't know Angular, that's a different audience from someone who is working in an enterprise and trying to implement a, you know, build a library or something like that. And one of the challenges with any documentation set is trying to target multiple audiences at the same time, which never really works out well at all. So uh, with all of our efforts, uh, we try to focus on the audience first, who are we targeting? Uh, and then we focus on what are the problems people are trying to solve and try to position the content to help address those uh, those problems. So uh, one of the things I, I I tell folks quite a lot is uh, you know I we want to make we want to get people back to writing code as fast as possible um, because uh, because that's what people like to do and that's what they're paid to do and that's what they they need to do. So uh, you know that means. Uh, 
trying not to spend a lot of time going into the weeds on on implementing implementation details or concepts if that's not what people want um, so right now we're transitioning a bit away as i think minko mentioned from sort of new developers and we're trying to address some of the content gaps for more experienced developers so that includes uh better content on on content projection change detection and uh, things like that and we've got uh, a number of other projects and what i do is we we i go to the team we discuss what projects are available uh you know for a given quarter or a given block of time and then uh, the team kind of votes on what we want to do next. Because after all, I am not the Angular expert. Uh, so I need subject matter experts to help create the content that we need. So uh, it's a partner effort. So that's what we're doing right now. I could talk all day, but I'm going to stop there. So just so you know. I would have a question. Um, to the talks. Um, are you planning maybe to lower the barrier to contribute to the docs? Because uh, when you want to change some um, wrong information or stuff like that, you have to go through the whole um, submit as uh, the whole um, contributing process uh, with tests and all that stuff. And this is sometimes when you just want to change a small link or whatever. Um, way too much work. To set up, and uh, you are frustrated and don't want to contribute. So, the the short answer to that question is yes. Um, I have been thinking a lot about how we can uh, make it easier for the community to contribute to the documentation. I don't own the GitHub processes and and pull requests and all that other stuff, so I'm not sure what we can do to make that part easier. Uh, but I am looking at uh, trying to find ways to help uh, help folks who want to contribute to the docs do so as as easily as possible. Um, so I I don't have any more additional details on that, uh, but but that is one of the uh, one of my priorities that I'm working on. I saw that someone else asked about uh, plans on translating the docs to other languages, and for that it's usually a volunteer effort. Um, but uh, one of the other things I'm also writing up is a document that kind of says, if you are translating the docs to other languages, here are the docs that you should translate first, and here are the docs that you can do as you need to do, you know, as needed later. Um, and that not only should help folks kind of have a, a milestone to reach, but also will help us so that we know if I'm changing the, you know, the introduction page, I know that that's also a page people translate, I'm going to be very careful about making changes there as opposed to maybe uh, uh, an obscure API method that uh, we're updating. So that's that's another effort that I'm working on. I think if there's not there's anything not else, anything it's time else. for a bathroom, bathroom break. break. Unless, Minko, you want to leave us off with anything? Nope, I think we're good for the bathroom break now. <laughs> okay, we'll see you all at the 50 mark five minute bathroom break and see you all in a second. So Greg, can you play some pause music? Hey Mike. Hello, I'm here. Hey, hey. So Greg, what Hello. about shaving a proper mustache? It's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. Love it, love it. We're so close. Yeah, yeah, it looks, I can't really imagine it at the moment. Uh, looking <laughs> forward to that. We're going to see how disgusting I can get it. You just need to have it so it uh, does little little curls on the side. It looks like it hurts. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> I haven't been able to feel my face for 15 years. I haven't been able to feel. Ever. Hey, Michael. Michael? Which Michael? Which yeah, you. Michael? Yeah. Ja. ja. <laughs> Okay, you can't recognize me, right? So because it's dark. Yeah, yes, yeah. I see uh, the bar. There was a. Um, you were hidden behind the side menu. Yeah. Okay, let's. Hello, it's me. If I doze off, I started at 4 a.m., so it might not be that articulate later on. I think it's all at 4 a.m. Oh, but it's only 9.50 a.m. now. <laughs> I don't think I was Yeah, over there it is, over here. <laughs> no, my... My mind has the habit to of waking up with ideas on how to fix bugs and stuff like that, and then I try to go back to sleep, but that usually doesn't work out. So I just go and fix the bugs and be done with my work at like nine and have all day all day to slack off. Hey y'all, I don't know if you've seen my lights flickering. I suspect I may lose power, so if I suddenly drop off. That will be why. Y'all didn't know it. Hawaii's having a pretty bad storm. Storm enough that we have snow in Hawaii as of yesterday, last night. So it um, won't be surprising if I lose power, but I just noticed all my lights are flickering. So I want to just give you a heads up. If I'm suddenly gone, that would be why. Oh, my goodness. Snow wow. so is it Hawaii. heavy yeah. snow and rain, or is it is it wind also? Uh, yesterday was the most amazing wind. It was like a hurricane. Well, you you will understand. It was hurricane, uh, 50 mile gusts, really cloudy, really windy for about four hours, and then the clouds cleared. And Haleakala had snow down to about 7,000 feet, which is fairly low for here to have snow. Wow. Um, it has happened a couple times in the past where we've had snow at about 9,000 feet, but for it to get down to 7,000 feet is pretty remarkable. You're not planning a hike up there. They close it because people don't know here don't have the equipment to be in the snow. And so what ends up happening is they let people up there and then cars slide and people don't know how to be in the snow. So it's very dangerous. Um, so basically they've closed the volcanoes. You can't get up there right now. There's a little cheat way that I'll probably try maybe later today if there's any sun that if you know about it, it's a four wheel drive road you can take up there, but I'm sure it'll be just crammed with people who do know about it. Um, but I might try just because I haven't seen snow. I'm on my first like proper winter with real snow. And today I had my first proper like total wipeout in the snow and I nailed my elbow. So I'm feeling like, yeah, real winter. It's great. <laughs> so don't bail is my advice i think it's still 70 degrees here so when we say it's freezing it's like you know it's Hawaii, but there is snow i can see snow so it's cold somewhere <laughs> we so almost like froze last night uh, we had to bring plants in and everything so uh you know here in florida it's also not nearly the struggle up north but uh, yeah, even down here we actually have some frost and some freezing and I think Northern Florida might have gotten a little snow. And we don't have 7,000 feet high, so it would be low. But beach snow, I've never seen beach snow before in person. That seems really cool. Is there such a thing as beach snow? Oh, yeah. Let's <laughs> go. Where does, Virginia, regularly but... Where does it beach snow regularly? Because I need to visit that. Oh, regularly. Oh. Uh, I think oh, Virginia one of the, the northern countries. The Great Lakes, maybe? 
Great Lakes. Yeah. I was saying definitely New England. Yeah, New England. Yeah. Well, I'm forgetting about all those places up north in the eastern part of the world. <laughs> where where it gets very cold. Lighthouse snow. Yes. It's minus ten here right now. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but it, it's plenty cold. Where is that? That's down by Melbourne? I'm in Stockholm at the moment. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, Totally across the world. If anybody is yeah. wondering, 14 degrees Fahrenheit, that is cold. <laughs> Crazy cold. <laughs> That's NG Vikings cold. <laughs> yeah, that, if, if you get your phone out, it's like empty in a minute. The battery freezes and it dies. Like we can absolutely do a Vikings in Stockholm, though. Then I don't have to go anywhere. Was it NG Vikings that I was like freezing my butt off? I'm trying to remember. Well, I mean, there was like we were walking outside at NG Vikings, and there was like ice and snow that you could tell had been there for like months on end. I can't imagine like it being cold enough to just day like <laughs> that was you know my very first ng comp the one where i didn't know anyone or the angular team it was snowing because i have pictures of me walking through utah in the snow and thinking what is this place and why would we have a conference here <laughs> one of my developer well, like, friends was asking when it started snowing at ng comp he was like is this ash i was like <laughs> you're such a floridian no it's snow honey <laughs> I miss the flowers at NGConf the most, like the garden. That's the tulips. I was just yeah. mentioning that to someone last Saturday when there were some tulips here at the farmer's market. Oh, I miss that place where you just walk through the tulips in the garden. That, that just so feels nice. like home for me. Yeah. Well, Minko's back, which means we can get started. <laughs> oh, oh. Do you want to introduce? Do you want to introduce? Sure. Yeah. The next, well, the next topic on the agenda is state management. Generally, state management has been one of the kind of controversial areas, I would say, because we provide the state management primitives, but we haven't been too opinionated about the way that you should manage your state. And there are different community alternatives right now, which are getting a lot of traction and uh, they're very widely adopted. So uh, that was the that's going to be the focus of the next discussion. There are some of the authors of these state, state management solution here today, I guess, right? I saw Michael Hlatke, and now I don't see him, but he was somewhere around. Michael, if you're here, say hi. No? Did you leave? All right. He uh, was here like five minutes ago, so you're not crazy. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess what we can uh, do first is uh, discuss, I guess, typical state management solutions uh, just using Kangaroo services and RxJS. This has been a pretty popular way to manage your state, just expo like keeping it inside of an Angular service, and from there having exposed the behavior subject that notifies all your components on updates. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, oh yeah, here is Michael. Michael, you're back. We we're just discussing state management, and you're. Oh, food. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna chat with you in a bit. Uh, so uh, I, I'm curious. Uh, generally, what is the distribution of folks who are using, uh, like, building, uh, let's say, using a state management library versus just taking advantage of the uh, primitives that we provide in the Angular framework. Does anyone have like a, a, an observation and uh, opinion about that? So maybe I will ask a clarifying question before. Like, so when you say like primitives, or, like do, do you mean uh, like maybe enumerate those primitives? So we'll, because maybe people have different things on their mind. Yeah. Uh... Let, because yeah, like, are, are you talking about the async pipe or like you know like the triggering the change detection or or both? 
Yeah, yeah, generally just keeping, yeah, I guess there are different types of state as well. Uh, usually I distinguish between the view state that uh, you directly, view model that you directly bind to, and also there is some like shared state across different components. So I'm primarily targeting here the, the shared state between different components, and where do you keep them in your component hierarchy, or in uh, what abstractions are you keeping it? I guess there are different alternatives. You can keep it in your parent component somewhere, or in the root, and pass it down the component tree, and this way, like it has its pros and cons. Or you can keep it in a shared service, or you can keep it in a something like an NGRX store. Uh, just wondering how many folks would generally depend on, um, would prefer to not depend on a state management library and instead would prefer to handle the state management themselves? Or let Angular take care of it? I recently got feedback um, from a company, I guess I guided in that state management thing quite a while ago. And they did two bigger projects with um, one with NGRX and the second one with a little bit smaller one with N NX, I believe. And now they implement it all on their own. Um, I was really curious <laughs> why and, and how it got. Um, as far as I can recall, the code base was. Um, it was less files, less less dense connections, and what, what I realized was very interesting. When people use global effects like NGRX effects or such effects with Akita, um, it is very easy to have like effect loops and debugging and following the trail of like effects that trigger effects that trigger effects that then end up in state is like super hard. And in those self-written things, those situations barely occur because they have like the source and then these effects that are in between like in one piece of code in front of them they have a little bit of duplication of, of operators but in general i guess they will have a way better time to manage this this effects part now it's a really drastical difference of of files and how how much time it takes them to introduce something else that, that's actually super interesting what you say about the effects uh, because like I, I just like literally yesterday had a conversation about it with one of the teams uh, that were experimenting with the um, like Svelte has the this kind of store solutions that could be adapted to to Angular I mean, like that's like you know very generic yeah. uh, like in, in the Svelte framework like they have like a store solution which is uh, very very basic somehow but um, but but that, that's exactly what, what is happening there is that like the, your effect like your your effects are in a code in one method somehow and and there was this discussion between the the team heavily involved in, in NGRX and the other team and it was like where are my effects but the other team was like but what are the effects why why would I need them in the first place right like so this this is this uh, interesting uh, tension here between like introducing those abstractions and like kind of explaining why there is a value in them. Oh, I'm already on, unmuted. Um, I think it's very good for Angular to be uh, state agnostic, which is not really true, but you, you get my drift, because uh, for every application, there is a, a different state management that is optimal for the application. And it really depends on what they need, on the speed they need it, and, and a lot of things. So keeping this open is, I think, one of the strong points of Angular. Although I hear people know they should include something like NGRX. I, I think it's a good thing it's not included. I do like NGRX, but it has its use and its place. Um, I usually roll my own uh, if, I need, if I need state. And I firmly believe that state should be really handled on the server and not in the client anyway. But there are so many applications and so many different ways of handling states. And the great thing about Angular is that it supports all of those ways. Um, I would love it if Angular would support a little bit more reactive reactiveness so that I could have better flows in there. I'm on it. <laughs> yeah, I have to second uh, Thunder on this. Um, I, I prefer not to be bound to any library because there are different use cases and not all of them 
require the same complexity and or have the need for the integration of a library so complex and that introduces so much code which then is a lot of maintenance and then I prefer to have more options also in the context of enterprise many times Angular is not living standalone and then you have to combine different stores which defeats the purpose of having a single store and that's a problem. So when you have the, the, the independence and the ability to make your own choices in this regard is a lot better. I think the only downside that I've seen when I've worked with projects and with different clients is that for juniors that are using Angular on a wider team, they can sometimes not figure out where to put state, like or what I what even is state, like what is state and what where should be put. And I, and I think by Angular staying agnostic it kind of makes it difficult for them to realize that oh this is something that should be put potentially in a state management store or in some sort of state management solution. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, something I'm curious, you, a couple of you mentioned that there are different use cases for different state management solutions. Have you had the, and I agree with this, have you had the opportunity, have you thought about like just uh, creating different categories of applications where a particular state management solution is more appropriate than others? That's, this might be a step forward to recommending uh, different approaches for different kind of applications. Yeah, I think it also really depends on the background of the team and their experience. Because if they're all coming from .NET and they are used to, to things like uh, they have similar things to NGRX in, in C Sharp. So if they're coming for that, they will pick that up easily. If they are uh, newer developers, they have no clue what NGRX is about and it takes forever for them to, to grasp the concepts. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering if we should maybe be not obviously bring it into the framework because it seems like that would just lock too many people into a solution they don't need. But maybe we could be more opinionated at other places like the docs or other resources um, for those beginners who are like lost in the ether. I didn't, I don't know if that's possible or if maybe we want to stay unopinionated in the docs about state management. We've discussed this actually, Dick, and yeah, go ahead, sorry. I think it's a very good idea to add some documentation around this on the on the Angular documentation about state and say, hey, for Angular, there are different kinds of states and you co can go with a simple service with not even not observable, but just an object in there till something like NGRX and, and just point out the types of state managements that are available for Angular, uh, don't point them to it, but say, hey, for like, we have these kinds of states, you can do that with basic Angular, we have like observable state, there are blocks about those things, so you can point to a couple of those blocks. So people have that are coming into Angular have a place where they can read about state and why, why it isn't in Angular and what is available. So yeah, to answer um, your question, uh, Minko, uh, I think, um, I can see different categories of applications, like one that live in the enterprise world, like with lots of forms everywhere. I don't think that they necessarily need like some sort of state management that just overcomplicate stuff. And yeah, those kind of application could just use, I mean, just <laughs> quote, use a service or something like really lightweight. However, if you're building something like, uh, let's say like a Photoshop, like web app, where do you have like need to, the track state everywhere, or say you're building a game where state is really important. Um, yeah, so the, the, these are like either three main categories for for like which kind of state or no state at all kind of library you could use. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's why I agree. <laughs> we shouldn't mm -hmm. have like a built-in state. Uh, library or right. whatever. So, so the the other kind of question I would like to ask, like as Minka said, oh, like should we uh, have one state or not? Like uh, everyone is kind of saying, like, oh, we should probably not. But but I think there is other kind of categorization which is interesting is that like many many people went into the kind of call them push based um, 
state management. So like either like RxJS with behavior subject on NGX or like any any system would basically notifies you uh, that the state change. Or we've got this other category where we've got just services with the like we are pulling right or we are calling the method and so on. Um, and I, I think the the other interesting discussion would be like if for people that are using those push based uh, systems. So like either let's say behavior subject on a service. Should we have more integration in the framework to make life of those people easier? Because uh, we've got obviously async five, so we can easily subscribe uh, in a template. But but we uh, like if you, if you want to consume those streams or we want to push to those streams, uh, it's kind of more manual work. Uh, and like if if you see like the, what other frameworks are doing, they are kind of providing more sugar to to plug into those reactive streams. Uh, so I, I guess I'm trying to ask two questions. Like one is, are we settling on one big pattern? Like, are, are we into more like observable streams versus just pool? And the second question for me is, question, if we are setting more on the like, you know, those push-based systems, should we have more facilities in the framework for easier consumption or not? And I guess I'm I confused everyone. <laughs> no, uh, no, I was I, trying to take notes as well. Uh, sorry for. Uh, so it's uh, I I like the push versus pull, and I think that's that's something which is uh, the the thing that is making us harder for us to to make the decision is because we have this pull based thing around uh, component level state management where yeah. you know, we have change detection and data binding. Yeah, at, at the heart, Angular was kind of pull based, right? Yeah. And at the same time, we have the push-based one, exactly. and the push-based one it comes with a little bit of a well steep on learning curve because you need to go through all these op RxJS operators if you want to go with RxJS. And it's uh, I, I would say we don't we don't necessarily have to go with one or the other. Uh, we we can have better support of let's say reactive inputs because I know that that's that's a uh, not reactive but let's say observable inputs because that's uh, a very highly demanded issue and we should be able to make it happen even without coupling the framework core with that with rxjs right and, and that's excellent point right like because we we often in the angular community we put equality sign between like reactively of subscribable thing and rxjs but like you know there's a more general pattern here yeah uh so <clears throat> i understand that rxjs uh is uh, yet another uh, you know, a learning curve when, you know, folks starting with Angular uh, on top of all the many other things, right? And that kind of loses more appeal. But I think as a framework itself, we should, you know, decide that it, either we promote RxJS and it's definitely one of the core things that you have to know, or you don't, because we're trying to pretend to be kind of both. And I don't think that kind of works in general. Um, it's things like that we've been doing with, for example, NGRX Component Store was trying to glue those two pieces together, pretending that we still have uh, components and classes that are uh, that are, you know, uh, those inputs that are non-reactive and things that they're very imperative, and providing some of the reactivity benefit that you know, that's what people typically go for Angular for, right? Having this uh, uh, framework that's uh, very, you know, like enterprise ready and, and, and solves all the com uh, hard cases and things like that. So uh, I think Angular should decide if, if, if it's with the RxJS or not. I don't think it'll be very hard to pull it yeah. out. It'll be almost next to impossible to pull it out. But at least the general guidance is like, hey, we're moving into this direction and this reactivity that you have and you using all this RxJS things for, uh, we have a solution that we or we we would like to propose an alternative solution to this, and the solution sounds like this, for example, right? I think this would be a helpful discussion, um, and I know may you know I've spoke with many of you in different forums, and I I was getting that feedback as well <laughs> from many of you. I don't know if you wanna uh, you know, somebody else wants to add to this as well. Yeah, I, I oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry, I I go ahead. <laughs> I, I really like the, the observable support in Angular, but it is lacking in a couple of areas. And I have been vocal about this for a while, so I, I think I won't repeat myself here. 
but we are lacking a couple of pieces and those are not big technical issues to, to add to Angular. If we add them to Angular, it doesn't mean that Angular is only reactive. It means that Angular will support reactive, the reactive workflow better. Um, I kind of disagree because I don't think uh, we should have developers choose for observable workflows. I think they should have the choice by themselves. And Angular is in a pretty unique situation that it can support both more or less equally well. Uh, because the, the whole flow without observables is already reasonable possible with a couple of exceptions which are solvable and the reactive flow or the, the observable flow is already largely possible with a couple of omissions here and there. And there are no big technical reasons to, to fill in those gaps. And I would love to see more observableness in Angular. Uh, but at the same time, I would love to see uh, it not be b being mandatory for the same reasons that I like to have like choice in in state management. I like to have choice in, am I going observable? Because some teams will run with it and will go observable all the way and they will get it. And other teams uh, will never, ever understand how an observable works. So I hope we can enable both use cases. Talking about observables, also it's interesting looking at the developer survey. So we, when we looked at the results, about 50% of people really loved observables and about the other 50% they didn't. So, yeah, I, I, I don't get that other 50%, but I know they are there. Yeah, yeah, it was 50-50, yeah, or like 45-55, something like that. Um, and yeah. Uh, I also uh, agree that you should keep it simple. And uh, IXJS and all this stuff is cool, but really for people who are, uh, begin with Angular or have smaller applications, um, it's too much overhead. Angular is already a huge toolbox, um, and you have to install a lot of stuff, you have to get into a lot of stuff, but uh, make the entry point, uh, or keep the ent entry point low and maybe lower uh, than now but don't make it uh, uh, more complicated. We, we all know uh, how the stuff is working, but a lot of people don't. And uh, in this case, let, let it, uh, the people really decide what they want to do or not. But really for beginners, for total beginners, it's uh, hard uh, to even get into Angular and uh, to uh, just learn another concept like RxJS, uh, GRX or whatever, it's a mess. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. A lot of the uh, people that I talk with are either new to the JavaScript in general or new to Angular. And once they, once you throw like an observable at them or like the idea of things being a stream, it's just a lot to take in and to digest on top of having to build, you know, your app in general. And there are some libraries that do help and some resources to help explain it, but it's still potentially an unnecessary uh, like learning curve when they just want to get it, something out to the screen. So is the same thing true with TypeScript? Because like all the arguments being made could theoretically also be made for TypeScript, right? But developers actually seem to love the fact that everything is consistent across the entire Angular ecosystem with TypeScript. But TypeScript yeah, is easier to say. understand. Yeah, the same as TypeScript is correct. Just using the patient is okay, but everything which goes more, so I don't know, condition types, something like that, then it stops. Yeah, so I haven't really worked on a code base either that doesn't have reactive, like RxJS being used throughout it, like with an Angular. Like every code base I've worked on is using it in some form. So I don't think straying away from it completely is the best path, but maybe more documentation on what it is and how to use it with an Angular application could help junior developers and people new to Angular, people new to JavaScript development, help them just learn how to use it. I'd say on that point, I don't know if people get a chance to look at them or if, if everyone here has actually gone through them, but there's 
a whole section of guides on RxJS in the documentation. Has anyone done a training or, or worked someone through it and actually had someone go through those guides and then saw what the result was? Do they come out of that unknowledgeable or do they come out of that confused? Are, are people just not finding those guides or are those guides difficult? So like I, I think I have got like another meta question. So like we we are saying like oh that's people who are probably don't like kind of don't want to go into this because of having difficulty. But like what I'm trying to understand and honestly I'm I'm facing the same problems in my company is like is it the problem with understanding the pattern like where you've got like you know this reactive like modeling data a stream to which you can subscribe. So is this the pattern being difficult? or the particular implementation of pattern in the form of RxJS. Because maybe you are mixing the two and like, you know, like going into RxJS and operator. So maybe it's kind of our fault partly that we are not, I know, you know, teaching it from the, uh, like, I, I don't know, like for me, like when I'm working with the teams, I see this kind of fundamental pattern mixed up in people's heads at the beginning with the actual implementation. And yeah. maybe there is some work to do here. Like, I, I don't know, I'm just kind of throwing up in the, in the air. Yeah, I don't I think it's the implementation. Oh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a pattern in general and, and the lack of a foundation to understand streams and how it works. I'm working with more the, uh, com complex data structures. Okay, when I, you come, I uh, something, something else, oh, sorry, but I will go now. Um, I think there is something else going on um, because Angular doesn't fully embrace observables. You have to jump to hoops, which makes working with observable way more complex than it needs to be. And that is the, the portion where people get confused. They need a click event, so they have to make a callback on their on the component and then from there put it in a subject. And it is the places where we are going in and out of the observable streams that are causing lots of confusion. And Angular can help there by supporting a couple of more things observable. That makes it easier to learn observable, but all at the same time, I fully understand that people don't want to learn observables and it is a hard pattern to grasp, especially in Angular because there are those extra hoops you have to jump to. And we need both. We, we need a simple approach from just put an object in this inside a service and share it all along a couple of components to the full blown uh, NGRX. I uh, uh, don't, I won't compare um, TypeScript with um, RxJS or NGRX because TypeScript is just JavaScript with a little bit uh, types on top. And uh, when you come into Angular, you have to learn JavaScript. You have to learn a little bit uh, uh, kind of this class concept. Um, but then when you uh, just uh, shift it with these whole stream uh, stuff, uh, it's really, uh, even in my, in my head, it's all, uh, always overblowing. I remember when I was with the workshop with Tracy and uh, uh, Ben, uh, 2017 or so, I understood the uh, things what they are doing, but uh, to just work with it and or to get uh, back into it, it's um, if you don't do it uh, on a daily basis, it's quite hard. And for for people who come into the framework, uh, it's a huge thing. I mean, I think something that's really easy is we do talk about the discoverability of these things. And, um, you know, <laughs> I think in any technology, right, like there's a million different websites and resources to use. Like even for Google's AMP project, you have this here, that here, what here, and everything's official, but there's like three different places to find all this information. And they're, they're presenting it in the same way, but a different way. So maybe even like some sort of list or something that's just, you know, straight up like, okay, hey, you wanna learn this part of Angular, do X, Y, and Z. You wanna learn this part of Angular, here's a set of resources, you wanna learn this part. And maybe it be something where, you know, that list can grow over time. Because as I'm getting into different pieces of Angular and wanting to learn different pieces of Angular, I love as well. I have a question for the Angular team. Oh. 
Mm-hmm. Um, have you folks um, done uh, some sort of developer studies where you invite a couple of developers with different profiles and like watch them use Angular or learn Angular from scratch? Like for instance, if you take someone who doesn't know JavaScript and ask them to use Angular and then see what are their struggles, like having some sort of checklist. Okay, uh, they don't JavaScript, so they need to learn JavaScript and then TypeScript and then like annotations and so on and so forth. And like have some different candidates, you know, with different profiles to, in order to assess, okay, what are the pain points of Angular and why most of folks are are um, yelling at Angular and telling, telling that it's really hard to learn. I think maybe that's, um, this could, bring some insights about the areas where you probably need some simplification or some other areas where you probably need more features. Just just an, throw in an idea here. Yeah, we've had such, uh, we, we've had such, such observations from folks. Yeah, it's usually, it, it depends, it still depends on the background and people can have like very different backgrounds. They could be used to uh, very dynamic languages and they are confused by the compilation process or uh, they might be not used to object-oriented programming or RxJS is usually, we're trying to not place it on the critical learning journey. So it's, it, it gets complicated when you uh, start looking at a uh, fancy uh, operation, oper- operator pipelines with the HTTP client, let's say, or forms or something like that. Mm. The feedback for, for very beginners, the feedback we've been getting is usually around just getting compile time errors uh, or just not understanding some of the Angular error messages. So that's why we worked on improving the Angular error messages. Uh, to, to, to get the discussion back, back to, well, it was originally state management, it went a little bit into RxJS. Um, wanted to uh, see whether you see state management possible without RxJS, Go back, going back to Pavel's discussion with pull versus push. What about if we just can have services, components, and check for updates? Anyone has anyone seen this approach? Or, or just to add to Minko's list, like, I mean, th- we also have this, like, fine-grained reactivity, like, as implemented in view free, or, like, you know, like, there are, pa- like, reactivity patterns without RxJS, and, like, is it worth exploring, right? I think the biggest question for me, and when I was looking into this, right, like the drawbacks of services in general, the pure, you know, calling the HTTP, let's pretend it doesn't return observable, or let's, let's say it returns a promise, things like that. Yeah, it was like sub- subscribable, let's say. Yeah, yeah, so, something like that, it doesn't matter. Uh, the biggest problem was how do you coordinate the same kind of events happening? So how do you coordinate, how do you cancel the previous one? How do you uh, make them in parallel? How do you make them, you know, in, in this sort of... So this is one of the biggest problems, right? And a lot of people don't realize that, right? Pretending to be, you know, just, you know, having a service, having a method that calls HTTP and does something. People don't even realize that they, you know, do things in parallel, right? And and cause all those types of race conditions. And you can get far enough without realizing this, but then eventually it'll bite you back, right? And we don't test for this as well, right? It's like, we don't test for race conditions. I, if somebody tell us for race conditions, like to know, <laughs> uh, but those things, you know, uh, we're trying kind of kind of to hide them. But for me, if we can surface them in a way that our folks can consume and understand, uh, that would be a big win. For example, right? And and in generally, uh, just a little sidetrack here. Uh, what we're we trying to optimize Angular for? Are we trying to optimize for small apps, or we're trying to optimize for enterprise ones? Because it's always a trade-off, right? So we're where we skew more of this, and then the other one goes to uh, that we're trying to optimize for easy onboarding, uh, easy learning curve, you know, getting beginners very easy, or do we uh, do we want to enable the people who already, you know, getting some expertise for them to control and, and, and do things in the easier way at that level? So I know it's always a trade-off, but we're still, it's always some kind of focus area. We can't just do both, right? It's just doing both never works. Uh, so this should be always some kind of optimization in, in that one. Uh, that was a little sidetrack. I don't want probably a lot of comments on that right now, but just just to, to think about this, right? 
getting back to the original one, how we orchestrate things, how we can bring it up front to the developers, orchestrating these events. If we can make it in an easier way, uh, then I'm all ears, because uh, that's what we had some of our solutions for. But why you can't uh, uh, split it or uh, do uh, what Wasim uh, was uh, um, speaking some kind of about uh, sound for me like personas. You have different personas using Angular, and for, uh, uh, then you optimize this. And I, I, we, uh, I'm from NGGuard, so we do uh, beginner workshops. And uh, for those who uh, attended as a mentor uh, to those workshops, there were also a few from the Angular team. They realized even stuff which is for them totally normal and familiar. It is for a person who is getting into the whole thing. It's quite hard. And uh, never forget that, because uh, if you don't onboard these people, you will just stay in your uh, small uh, environment. So, and uh, the, the Angular community wouldn't get bigger when we uh, don't onboard uh, new people. Because you will still, uh, the, uh, you will still be the same people. So, but why not um, making some kind of approach? Okay, we have a, a easy base, and then you like plug in a little, like whatever, you can add stuff and you can uh, make stuff on top of it, which, is, which uh, helps more the enterprise way, uh, which helps more, more specific stuff. Um, but keep the base really easy. So. I think we should, maybe we should not mix the concept of a new developer, a junior developer with the concept of enterprise, because there are many junior developers working on enterprise in very large and complex Angular projects. Um, so it's like two kind of streams that need to be addressed the junior developer and the large versus medium or small applications that have different kinds of complexities. Um, separate things, in my opinion. Well, I think also, you know, if you just ask Twitter <laughs> what content they want to see, mostly when I ask this question, it's, you know, stop giving me beginner content. Like, can can we have more content that's a little bit deeper, that's useful for my um, work, right? Because um, I think a lot of content out there, sure, it's 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 you know it's about discovery and and beginning Angular, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but kind of diving into what enterprise developers need is is I feel like something that has been lacking. It's up to Mark to create all those YouTube videos. This is, this, oh, sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, can I say something about that, though, in, in terms of what content look, looks like and what people are asking for? So what's really interesting is as I've been doing more content on YouTube for our channel, our official channel, I ask people to tell me what they want. You know what I see? People really want us to tell them about, like, the features that Angular has because there are so many features. And so people really want us to highlight, like, hey, how does this work? Show me how to do this thing. But then when I keep going through the comments, I'll see someone say, how do you do a best practices version of uh, PDF rendering? So so we do see exactly what, what Tracy's saying is, like, we do see that uh, group of people who do want, you know, that more advanced stuff. But then we have people who just really want us to show them, hey, when you release, like, 11.1 .1 and you say, we'll tweet, like, we have 10 new features. People kind of want us to walk them through those features so they can understand how to incorporate those into their applications. And one other thing I'll say that's really interesting is, and I'll talk to Dave Shevitz about this uh, quite a bit, it's like the Angular learning journey. And, you know, I've been talking to him just about, like, what does that look like for a new, for a person new to Angular? Like, what are the core topics that, if you were to start today, what can I teach you about that you could build an effective application this week? Right. And I know that you're going to want to scale eventually. Sure, you will. But just when you build anything, though, nobody needs to be. Um, I, I use the pool analogy where I say that Angular, there's a lot of space in the three foot deep uh, of the pool before you get to the eight foot, you know, deep end where you can do all the really like important stuff. But I feel like there's still a lot of space in that three foot side that we can continue to surface that like direction for them to let them know here's all the things that you need right now to build effective applications and then you know that stuff will reveal itself what's really important what they need as they build because that's how you build applications right now that's how all of you do you don't really read the documentation and look at the most advanced stuff and say okay let me make sure that i use this right now what you do is you build until you have a question 
And then you go from that question to re to find out what is the thing that solves this need. And I think that part of the angular learning journey has to continue on that path is, yeah, give you enough to get started with, give you the fundamentals, and then make it really easy for you to discover and to surface those things once you run into it. And I think if we tell that story, I think when we talk about the different personas, we, f we really do kind of hit a lot of those targets. But I think it's really interesting to talk to people who are new developers, junior developers, uh, React professionals, you, you know, and then see what that looks like or somebody's coming from a boot camp and they, all they really learn is something maybe like jQuery and a little bit of React. W how would they use Angular? So I think there's a lot of op options there. I agree. This is a really good point, by the way. I, it's it's very important for people to get in, and I think Robert also made this point to make it easy. But I think we should also set the expectation uh, right at the beginning, because again, I, I see people coming out of two week you know week or two week training in Angular, and they come in the Angular experts, and they don't want to learn anything because they already know the basics and they can build a thing. And this is the problem. If we can also set expectations that, hey, by the way, here's a roadmap, right? This is the first thing you build, but then there's don't push change detection strategy somewhere there. So setting expectation that you can build things, but if you the, you want to be in a more you know uh, proficient level, those are still a requirement kind of thing. So uh, make it available so you can build things early and good and they work, but setting the expectation that hey, if you want to really learn Angular. Uh, here's another checklist of things that we, you, you know, you kind of, uh, you know, need to go through, and we can provide you the content how to learn those things. Just, just be aware upfront that these are the things that still need it. Because uh, I know I just joined another company where there's a 50 front end engineers, and I've been pointing to like five of them who are top experts, and none of them know how on push works or ever seen it before. So. Th that's a problem. <laughs> maybe you could so, uh, maybe yeah. you could could put uh, different learn learning levels. Like uh, same, you have a conference. When you have talks, you have different labels like beginners, advanced, experts, and you could do the same kind of labeling, the same kind of filtering your content uh, on the docs. Uh, so when you have beginners, just filter it, give them the basic uh, stuff. When they get, get more, getting more advanced, they get also the other stuff. Um, well, I was and, even uh, talking with Frosty yesterday about um, NG Comp versus NG Enterprise, and it's almost instead of like the level of advancement, it's almost like what direction as far as like this is more of a community thing versus an enterprise thing, and then there's different levels within those two branches because, I mean, these conferences that he's facilitating, it's very obvious with what tracks like you can have. He was talking about how we have a single talk on module federation in the community version versus an entire track of that in the enterprise. And so I think maybe that could be a way of breaking it up, possibly. Um, <clears throat> I would like to say something. I hope I can explain it in a simple way. Um, when you ask on Twitter, so what did you what, what do what do you don't like in Angular? Um, you will you will hear so they don't like observables streams. Um, because of the lack they didn't understand um, what uh, async is, so what's something which is asynchronous. So that's mean they only. Uh, they, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. What I what I meant is there's a fundamental problem is most of the devs didn't understand what promises is and what observables is, and they under, didn't understand what's uh, async um, what's async is. Um, Okay, I, I will I will I I will I will ask later. So I'm too 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 excited at the moment. <laughs> I will I will I will. Um... I think you are right. Uh, a lot of people don't understand what async is and what sync is, and yeah. they get confused all, all around. Yeah, this, around this, those is a, this is the biggest 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 uh, uh, lack. And um, then you will have two 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 groups. So one they they. They work in a way what you described before, so without any uh, observables and without any promises, so in a in a in an Angular way. So you write the, the two-way data binding, so, and you will have the other side. They, um, no, I will I will stop and we'll talk later. So, <laughs> I'm too excited. So at the moment, I wanted I to jump in if possible. 
Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead, Tracy. I was just going to say one other thing is, you know, whenever we do content, right, like the beginner content is always the most popular, you know, but then it's like, what are you optimizing for, right? Of course, the beginner content will be more popular because there's a lot of developers trying to learn things, but is that really the most important stuff to put out just because it has the most amount of views? Maybe not. Maybe it's like the difficult problems, <laughs> you know, are the, are the ones to do. Because I think also when people look at, um, you know, enterprise-related solutions, right, they're looking to solve their own problems. And if there's more content out there about solving problems and, oh, by the way, you're using Angular and this is a good solution, then I think that also kind of helps the ecosystem. Uh, since yeah. we are uh, yeah. approaching kind of the, the time for the next discussion, server-side rendering, I wanted to make sure we have some actionable next steps so that we can do some improvements. Looks like uh, the state management topic got sidetracked a little bit into RxJS mostly and how Angular can have better support for it, which is actually not a surprise because uh, looking at GitHub, the number one, the number two, Issue probably right. It's it's in it's in top three for sure. Is uh, observable support in inputs, and uh, does this mean that if we implement observable support in inputs eventually, if we're able to prioritize it and we find a way to make it in a way that it's not going to keep on the learning curve, does this mean that this is going to be a significant improvement in the world of state management for Angular? I have a, mo a module that does that. Alex, do you want to chime in here? I, I have a you know uh, a, a library that's uh, basically one class that does that. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, you know. I, I, okay. I think so I think there was a problem in. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, this is the Jerks component again. Nobody, uh, not not a lot of people know about it yet. But anyhow, um, I, I think with Angular, uh, the problem that a lot of folks tried to solve initially was the global state, right? And again, Aspire by Redux and things like that. Here we go with NGRX global store. There's Akita, there's NGXS and all this. And, and then there's a whole void for the more like component st state. And a lot of folks were using like behavior subject in this, but again, it comes with own uh, disadvantages. And, and, and even those um, raw blocks or uh, what do you call that? Uh, things that will definitely not make it easy uh, in there until you run into those things, basically. Uh, so we, we created this library of NGRX components, though, which is basically a single class, which should help that. So I think uh, from the NGRX perspective, as I could probably speak from the team behalf there, we tried to cover all the scenarios are for from from uh, in small small uh, projects to the larger ones to cover and bring that reactivity and and kind of orchestration. One thing that we're trying to bring more is those patterns because patterns is what people love about Angular in general. That's I guess this is the feedback that we were getting. Uh, just showing APIs and this is another problem. Just showing the APIs can get you so far. Of course, they are knowing them important, but then showing the actual patterns. Uh, is the whole uh, other level, and this is what people are asking for a lot. Give me the guide, show me the patterns. I want to clearly know how can I apply the whole thing, right? Don't let me just discover it, because <laughs> discovering it, uh, obviously, you know, that's when you run into issues and like that. You can get there eventually, but if you have patterns, show me the patterns. So this is one of the areas where we're trying to focus uh, a bit more uh, on the indirect side as well, for example. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. when I think about state management in general, I see that NGRX clearly provides great utilities, but also the, the recipe for handling your state is probably the core, like the most valuable thing. And yeah, so patterns, okay. So, so I guess next steps could be simplifying the integration with observables and uh, thinking about state management patterns that we can prescribe maybe even in the documentation when we discover them as like widely adopted and uh, without significant negative and implications. This is one of the uh, common too for the docs as well, is uh, a lot of the docs show the APIs, how to use APIs and all this. 
uh, and, and maybe how to structure the components. Uh, but there's one other piece, which is the state and the flow of it, right? So where do, where could they live? And so people will clearly, uh, you know, when they're designing things, when they're designing their app, if they are designing their app, they can think of, okay, this is my component structure is one thing, because a lot of people think about it, well, you have to implement this. And then the second almost parallel thing is like, where would the state live? How would the flow would be of this of the state? Like that's, you know, at least at least hinting people up front, like, hey, think about that as well, right? So that, that's and there's thing. also one thing. Can I add something? Yeah. Uh, there's also one thing is uh, maybe we should focus also like all the content and documentation about the the value of every feature. Like for example, I was checking the HTTP documentation page. And maybe we could add like some section that explains, okay, we're using observables because they are cancelable and you can add the retry operator and all this. And if people see the value first, then they can get the incentive to learn uh, more about it and then learn the patterns. I think we should also focus on the value. And by focusing on the value, maybe we can we can help people choose. Do they need this kind of state management or not? Is it a local state or a global state? Do they need state for that data and stuff like that? Like the value is something maybe sometimes we miss by focusing on the technology or the pattern and people are completely lost about that. It's mainly about the value, I guess. I don't know. That's one of the things that we're trying to do in the documentation with all our new content is make sure that we at least have a little bit of why is this important to you? What problem is it solving? Uh, you know, right up front. The tricky part is you want to keep that content as concise as possible because it's really important the first time you come across it. And I, I actually hear this a lot when I listen to people talk about learning Angular is like, you know, at first I really needed to know why this happened. And then a week later, a month later, whatever it is, you have you're like under the gun. You're trying to get something out the door. You're something's broken. Whatever. I don't need to read three paragraphs on why this thing exists and why it's important. Tell me the command I need, the method I need, the function I need. The striking that balance is extremely difficult because you know I never know when someone's reading the docs where they're coming in from. I don't know what they read before. I you know I don't know what they're going to read next. I try to guide that, but it is, you're right though, like having at least something right up front, because not only does that address what you're talking about, but it also says like, if you read a topic and you say, this is totally not what I'm interested in building. It is not answering my question. I don't know what I typed into Google search and how I got here, but it's not right. You know, within seconds, if you're in the right spot, as opposed to 15 minutes in reading a tutorial, that's like, this isn't what I wanted. So. <laughs> And that's why Stack Overflow is so popular. <laughs> yeah. I I'll leave that one alone. Well, if I, yeah. Uh, hi, how are you doing? Um, I'd love to to give a bit of input on this. Um, um, we're talking about the web here, about you know HTML, web apps, and stuff like that. We can solve these problems. We can think creative, uh, creatively also with the docs. So what I'm thinking about is like, uh, first of all, um, links um to to point you to guide you to the next level okay you're you're writing a doc or or something about beginners level and here are the links to um to help you with more advanced stuff uh, or maybe if you miss something basic then here it is um maybe even make it more of a of an application like um you put um uh you state somehow your um uh, your, your level, if you're a junior, if you're seeking for fast implementation details or something like that, or if you want to understand what happens, what, what is this, why, why things are happening this way. And then you will get content that will, uh, will be, you know, suitable for you. So all the data will be there. You, you will have maybe one place where you know that the um, uh, the documentation the uh, the guides the tutorials are really good are high level uh, but then you'll it will be very very flexible to search for something that you want and to have like the, the next steps available for you so just like having like um like you said now um 
someone who doesn't want the whole thing but wants the TLDR, right? TL, yeah. Um, so put the TLDR there and then, okay, so you want to also to understand why, then keep on reading. No, we're, <laughs> it's, it's not a printed book that we're talking about, right? Yeah, uh, it'd be a box about the documentation. We we can keep that discussion. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we're like uh, advancing in the schedule, and we should switch to uh, server side rendering. Um, and we sidetracked a little bit from state management to RxJS and documentation. Would you uh, about the? Uh, we should do a mental switch right now. It's hard to move from state management to server side rendering, but let's try. Uh, Adam, are you still here? I am here somewhere. Awesome. Yeah, would you want to just share a couple of updates? I have a couple of discussion topics also, but just want to, do you want to share quickly in a few words what is the current state of our server-side rendering since, as you probably know, it is mostly community-driven. Uh, from the Angular team, we're trying to support it, but Adam has been the core of it. So oh, I, I want to first acknowledge that it is me, along with Alan, uh, who's also on this call right now, um, who've been leading this project from a, uh, what we like to call a, a part-time basis. Um, so for those who don't know what Angular Universal is, we hear the terms server-side rendering or pre-rendering. That noise is not coming from my background, by the way, um, just in case anyone's wondering. Um, so when we talk about server-side rendering, pre-rendering, hydration, flickering, styles, um, adaptive services, all of these different things, that falls under the umbrella term of Angular Universal. What Angular Universal means is that you build essentially one application and it can be applied in a universal context. It can be applied on the browser, on the server. And from a universal perspective, our job, our charter, is to make that integration as seamless as possible. So that if you have an existing client-side application, the steps to take that from A to B so that it still maintains the performant expectations and ease of use that you take from the client and apply that on the server. And also incorporate a bunch of, of best practices around that. So that being said, as of V11, uh, Alan, I wanna give the brunt of the credit for on this, has put in a ton of effort to enhance a, a lot of our existing functionality. Uh, you mentioned in your, uh, your opening slides that uh, we have inlining of critical CSS. That was a huge ask from our community and it's been in our backlog for, I wanna say years at this point. Uh, people have been doing their own custom implementations or hacking around with their own styles, but for the first time we now are able to take advantage of uh, some Google built technology to analyze CSS and, and give us the style sheets we really want. And uh, in addition to that, you also mentioned uh, dynamic rendering. That is a huge ask as well. Uh, usually what we see in terms of uh, more advanced sites is that you'll have maybe a dynamic part of your site, but then a more static part of your site. So you'll consider that as maybe a storefront with a blog or something like that where you can have static pages that can be pre-rendered efficiently and reliably, but you also need some dynamic content uh, for certain routes as well. And so, like Minko mentioned in the intro, that was another piece of functionality that, uh, that was being hacked together in the community, but it was a constant source of frustration and people kept asking, can we do this better? And, and thankfully we could. Um, so, those are the, the two big ones that come to mind. I wanna leave some room for Alan to, to pipe in and, and mention all the stuff that I forgot, just because I know that there are at least two things. Alan is here. He says it's a little bit late for him, so he might not be able to join. Oh, he was uh, on before, okay, that's yeah. a shame. I, I uh, wanna give credit where credit is due. Um, <laughs> so, we have a ton of stuff in the pipeline as well uh, in terms of what we're looking towards in the future. Uh, we, we get uh, some issues, you know, constantly with global scope issues or, you know, how do we build applications, quote unquote, the right way for Universal. 
we mentioned earlier that, that Angular is all about patterns, right? People love patterns. And unfortunately, one of the more difficult patterns to get right is saying, I'm used to building an application in the client world, having access to document at event listener on the fly anytime I need it. You're telling me I need to do this differently? And so that mental gap is a little bit hard to overcome for people, but we're, we're hoping to make that a, a lot easier in the future. Uh, some other challenges that we can also discuss. I've noticed that um, a lot of folks are concerned about the implications of core web on core web vitals, since um, core web vital is a set of three metrics that Chrome developed, which are going to be part of the Google searching algorithm. And we don't, it's like search is kind of a black box. So uh, we don't know what exactly the implications are going to be, but they're going to be part of the score that eventually you're going to get and your uh, website is going to be ranked by. And so another thing is deployment. I believe this hasn't been a trivial, th well, if we, we worked with Firebase and like Netlify and uh, other companies and other like uh, products to make deployment of Angular universal applications simpler, but there is probably still an, a space for improvement there. Uh, just to kick off the discussion with Core Web Vitals, um, for, I don't know if you're familiar with the way that Angular hydrates server-side server rendered applications, but generally once Universal renders the app, it goes to the browser, the browser renders it, and from there when Angular takes over, it destroys this content and re-renders it from the beginning. Uh, and you're getting pretty much the exact same uh, view that the server originally returned, and it's absolutely transparent for the user. There is no usually, you can even like not see a flickering there. It's like, it's, 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 it's happening that fast. Uh, at certain point, however, uh, that was impacting the largest contentful paint of the application, which is one of these core web vitals metrics. So we spent a lot of time working with Chrome on ensuring that that's not the case because the way that we're hydrating the view doesn't impact the user experience at all. So what we did was uh, we were able to resolve this issue and so now this shouldn't be a problem anymore. That's just an update that I wanted to put, it, put up here. If you're interested in more details, we can continue the discussion. Uh, anyone interested actually in, in discussing this further or would you prefer to directly move to the deployment? I'm curious to know, Minko. Uh, yeah, I am too. Okay. Yeah, uh, I can share the, uh, I can uh, share it just, so pretty much originally um, when your application starts rendering, uh, the largest contentful paint metrics finds the largest, the element with the largest, the largest element on the page that contains some content and it throws it as a largest contentful, contentful paint like candidate. And the problem was that if you remove this element from the page, it is no longer considered a candidate for the largest content pool paint. So the way that Angular was hydrating the view was first, you're, you're getting the rendered content from Universal. Uh, from there, Chrome finds the largest content pool paint. Right after that, we were like destroying the view and Chrome was removing this largest content pool paint candidate. And during the rendering on the client from Angular, Chrome was finding the exact same elements, well, different reference, but pretty much the same element structurally as the largest contentful paint candidates. And that was creating issue. That was delaying the largest contentful paint significantly. So the metrics implementation changed a little bit. Now, when they find the largest contentful paint candidates, they do not throw it away, even if it's removed from the view, unless they find a larger element that is rendered on the page which contains some content. So this way, if you, if you render the same content twice, the largest contentful paint candidate is not going to be changed and it is not going to impact your uh, metric. That's, that's kind of the, the detail about the algorithm. Doesn't it impact then the layout shift if there is a larger candidate and then content gets pushed down, for example? Uh, this, yeah, well, this probably is mostly dependent on the styles and uh, how you're loading the styles or images. So these, I, I wouldn't see that there are necessarily any, any Angular specific things here. As soon as the 
the layout is uh, specified ahead of time when you render your application for the first time and the styles don't cause any flickering, this should be fine. You can totally have like a, a seamless experience there. Uh, one of the one exceptions I didn't find a solution for is if you have like different fonts and they have a little bit different height, there will be some content shift there. And that's one that is really hard to solve, but for the rest you can get really close to zero. Especially now Angular does the including of the CSS. Uh, there is a drawback there too. If all the CSS is inlined into the page, there is usually too much CSS and we need to start taking out stuff again. Yeah, it should be only the critical path, right? That is included in the page and yeah. nothing else. Yeah, and there are different approaches you could inline it, I guess. With uh, yeah. the current approach, we're inlining the critical CSS for the entire page since we're statically analyzing which selectors are in fact used inside of your uh, view, inside of your page, and we're just inlining this. And uh, there is Scully's approach, which Sanders can share more about. Yeah, I'm actually evaluating a couple of more approaches, but uh, right now we are using critical CSS, which is a tool made by, by Google. Basically, they analyze your page and extract only the, the stuff that is needed for the critical page, which can be different from Angular, because if you build an Angular application, it doesn't know on which route you're going to land, so they have to put in a lot more CSS than is actually needed for that exact page if you are doing server-side rendering. Um, so there are there are a couple, there are a lot of gray areas there, and it de really depends on what you want to optimize for. Uh, critical CSS is, is a good tool, but it comes at a cost. It's runtime intensive, so it will slow down your render a little bit, or a lot, depending on what you f what you find a little bit or a lot. Um, I'm I'm still looking for a good tool to analyze uh, analyze the CSS, and I'm working with uh, with another Googler on this. So. We have to see what's coming down the line. So, so Minko, I had another question related to the fix that you applied. Do you apply it to Angular Core or Angular um, Universal? Chrome. And... Yeah, it's a Chrome fix. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. So there is no breaking changes. No. Yeah. Oh, it's, I... uh, they were kind. Of, well, they they did they, they. So it's still uh, they're still iterating on, on over the implementation of the metrics. They don't want to. Uh, they want to move the web forward in general without breaking things uh, yeah. significantly. So we we work together, like providing them feedback about the implications, and uh, we were able to incorporate the changes in the metrics implementation. Thank you. Uh, what about the deployment story? Um, I'm curious, have you faced any significant challenges in the deployment? Also, James from Firebase, I believe, is here. We we spent some time working together on ensuring that there is smooth integration story with uh, Firebase functions. And uh, Tara is here. I know Netlify has been doing a lot of exciting things on simplifying the deployment of pre-rendered and server-side rendered apps. I, I, I can probably start, if you don't mind, and uh... Just tell you guys what we're doing at Microsoft on this on Azure. Is that something that's all close to my heart at first? <laughs> and then we're trying to really ease the story for deployment on folks who are using Azure with the new service called Azure Static Web Apps that we are releasing soon. Uh, it's currently in preview. You can try it out, but uh, it's going to be generally available in this year. Uh, so yeah, we we are looking at different ways how to improve the, the deployment of both like Angular application, but also um, server-side rendered Angular applications. And um, so we've hit some issues, and I don't know if I talked to Minka about this earlier, but for one of them was to uh, the, you know, when you build your app, ng 
build. It builds by default in dev mode, which is was problematic for some folks. So uh, I was I'm like I'm excited to have it build uh, in prod mode in V12. Is I don't know if that's still on the roadmap. That's one of the things we're doing, and now we're looking at different ways how to speed up the build and uh, just you know just work like deploy and have your stuff work there. And I'll stop talking. Uh, so as far as Netlify, uh, the deploy process has always been really easy for Angular in general, like a regular Angular site. Um, it's just a matter of dragging and dropping, hooking it up to your GitHub repo, or um, setting it up to the CLI, and just you throw it up and you throw it onto the CDN. So um, the CDN, the Content Delivery Network, uh, Firebase also uses one. Basically, just having uh, request get sent to a dumb server uh, with redirect knowledge so that it's getting to you faster to help with that whole global latency problem. So now with uh, Angular Universal, I'm actually, my blog post, I'm sending it to Miko and then it should come out this week. Uh, it's super simple with Angular Universal to set up pre-rendered uh, information. So basically uh, to deploy a part of your site with the pre-rendered contents, you just have to add Angular Universal and then um, push your project up to GitHub and then tell Netlify it's going to be in your dist project name browser is what you're going to send up to the CDN and that's it. So your new command will then be uh, npm run pre-render, which will do the build and will pre-render everything for you, thanks to Miko. Uh, and so that's easy to get that pre-rendered structure up there. Uh, and then we're working on a process uh, that we're pretty excited about. We did this with Next on Netlify. Um, there's a lot of things that happen the same with server-side rendering for Next. Uh, like with Angular Universal, it checks your routes and lets you know, is this something that exists already that has been pre-rendered because it has a file extension? Is it something that's coming from the API? So uh, so that's handled with some other uh, like serverless functionality uh, or however you have it set up. Um, or is there no file extension, which means this is something that needs to be rendered server side. We can take those redirects and actually wrap the whole functionality of Angular Universal in a serverless function uh, to make it more uh, serverless friendly and more aligned to the Jamstack architecture. So that's the process, I just feel like my mic's not here. That's the process that we're going through. And then um, we have some things in the pipeline that I can't uh, delve into too much, but basically um, with that process, it's a one-click deployment uh, to do, to wrap it all up in a serverless function so that you know, I feel like when you use Angular, you have a lot of things ready at your fingertips. Uh, so this will be another thing where it's just like one-click deployment and you have your server-side rendering handled by a serverless function. Uh, and then the next thing that hopefully we'll be able to get out soon, but it's handling a lot of uh, the caching for you to be able to speed up that build time so that you're not re-rendering a lot of things and you're not hitting that uh, that serverless function in order to render anything because that is already built. So that's the process that we're really excited about. Um, we should be having more information soon. Um, and then once that's out, I can actually write content that shows you <laughs> more words on what I'm talking about. But that's it on our side. Um, hey, I'd actually like to add uh, to what Wasim said, and I'm really excited about everything that Netlify gives because it gives us also an example here. Um, and I'm wondering if you're doing the same. Um, part of the, the process uh, on web apps in Azure is to use uh, GitHub Actions, actually, where um, we're Use, uh, the user uploads the, the application to GitHub, and then whenever there is a push, uh, it's being built with the Angular command. That's why we need the ng build. Uh, uh, we prefer it to be in, in production mode. And 
I think that um, a lot of the a lot of the things should be happening there. Like uh, if if we need to use universal or anything else that the user wants to control somehow, um, I think it should be available to to happen in actions because eventually um, the um, hosting the the application itself is kind of a black box on Azure, and it serves the static uh, static assets mostly. Of course, we have the option to add serverless uh, functions, but I think that that will be better practice to use them as part of like uh, the application running itself and not pre-rendering it. Um, tell me what you think. Maybe maybe we'll see. Maybe you know something uh, better. Uh, oh yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't want to go into details because that's not the topic of this, okay. of this talk. But I'm happy to answer okay. all your questions afterwards. But I mean, just want to mention that yeah, lots of I guess cloud providers are doing the hard work to just ease the deploying process. Uh, with some of us collaborating with the Angular team, in order to have this smooth um, ex user experience and developer experience mostly. I think. But yeah. I think <laughs> I could be wrong. I think Firebase uh, Netlify does. CICD automatically with Git pushes when you initialize it. And I think Firebase does too, right? Very seems. I don't know. Let's say yes. Uh, one question I have for both. Uh, sorry, for, so since recently we now support hybrid rendering. And actually, that's a term that I borrowed from the React community. So. Uh, this this it sounds a little bit foreign here, I guess. Uh, the, so basically, Universal can recognize whether a page is server-side rendered or pre-rendered. So if a page is pre-rendered ahead of time, it is going to serve the static HTML content. Alternatively, it is just going to serve it is going to server-side render the page and return it. And by it, it does this all by default. It analyzes the application, finds all the routes, checks whether a route has parameters, and if it has parameters, it is not going to be pre-rendered, and so on and so forth. I was wondering uh, how this how does this fit the Jamstack and how does this fit the deployment story in both like Netlify and Azure? So, I mean, could you have any documentation to this publicly available? No. <laughs> Is that, well, it, that's it's actually, that's actually listed in Angular Universal about the routes on the Angular Universal page. Yeah, yeah, we have about the routes. The just Universal got a little bit smarter uh, thanks to Alan um, over the past release and. It now distinguishes between pre-rendered and non-pre-rendered pages, and that's definitely a, a much more jam-stacky approach. Um, and I mean, it sounds familiar to Purple, to uh, what is it, uh, PWAs, uh, where a really great approach to doing these things is having a type of app shell created, uh, which would be like your pre-rendered content. Um, so having everything that you can have there, so you have the first paint very quickly. Um, and then the only thing that differs uh, with the, uh, oh, and it's the same thing with the Jamstack approach where you're pulling in data when you need it. Um, so that is, it's very, it's very on par with the Jamstack approach. How we could make it even more stronger to that approach is um, using serverless functions instead of having to set up uh, the server functionality yourself. Uh, and I think, you know, that's definitely the route that I've been trying to just uh, keep full steam ahead with Angular. And we're doing a lot more. Um, I, the ng-conf will have a whole serverless uh, Angular workshop where we do a lot of the um, auth and grabbing data with serverless functions. But yeah, I mean, like the hybrid rendering approach, uh, it's such a buzzword now. So you're obviously on the right track. Um, but that's definitely, it's definitely going in that direction. It's really exciting to see Angular being able to be built that way because we've had so many things with getting the opportunity to have web crawlers read everything because we have pre-rendered content and then obviously having faster builder uh, build times and deploys is along that route too, especially once we start to really work with caching on that. So, uh, Minko, uh, um, as far as, you know, Angular goes and, you know, the community is asking you for features, for bug fixes, for a lot of stuff to do implement in Angular. However, when it comes to deployment, I think it's it's up to you to tell us how you should 
um, like how we should be deploying Angular applications. What would be the your idea, and by you I mean the Angular team and the ideal deployment story. Uh, so we could probably align to that. And by by we I mean I mean I am talking from around myself or Azure. Um, yeah, that that's something might be interesting to hear from you uh, if you have anything to request. I can talk about that. I'm wondering if anyone else from the team would want to to join to to like talk about this. Yeah, I just want to to add again as a as a an enterprise architect myself that it's another thing I wouldn't want to be imposed on me because there are some pipelines and some integrations that are not flexible, and then you you are subject to that and. This is why I always prefer to have the flexibility to decide. I mean, there could be a recommendation, but there should never be an imposition on how or what a CBCI pipeline should look like. That's just saying. I think One of the, the challenges is with, with, as you take each opinionated step towards more opinionation around CICD as well as server-side rendering and hosting, there are downsides, right? If, if we could server-side render and pre-render every application without any downsides, we would just say, do that, of course. Um, but there are performance implications, there's user implications that uh, are somewhat negative, right? Like, and I think if we can get rid of those on a long enough timeline, maybe like, I don't know, three, 10 years, somewhere like that, uh, then the opinionated solution is server-side rendered plus pre-rendering plus client-side of like hybrid uh, hydration, all those sorts of things. Um, but until then, I, I think we probably need to give developers a, a little choose your own adventure of like, what are you optimizing for? Are you optimizing for um, hosting costs? Are you optimizing for uh, first load experience? And then maybe there's trade-offs that you can make per page. Like I think if you look at, for example, Scully, this idea that um, maybe in the future you can choose which pages are pre-rendered, which pages are server-side rendered, and which are just pure client-side because there's no point. Um, I, I love that idea where you can optimize for the experience at each point in your application. So one area that we actually don't give developers a choice that's development or the deployment focus right now is CSP. Um, whether you're using Scully or Universal or just a regular Angular app right now, you can't turn on CSP without like unsafe inline and some of those other settings disabled which is for a lot of enterprises that's a no-go like security group won't let you deploy an app that doesn't follow the csp or that, that has to unsafe everything so that's an area i have a i'll link the issue but i, I would like to get more people involved in the discussion there and what we can do and, and how it's impacting you um so that, that's an area that I think we're gonna hopefully try to get a little more uh, attention to, and if, if you're out there working in, in an enterprise or doing deployment and you uh, have security issues around that, please uh, follow this issue and, and pitch in with some ideas. Put me on the ping list. I have some of my opinions around that too. With Scully, we can help a little bit, but it's a hard subject. Oh yeah, that's in the chat. Thanks. I'm also curious to know to hear about like from the from other folks here in the chat. How do you usually deploy your Angular apps? <laughs> Nobody deploys their apps. No. <laughs> we just hand it over to DevOps and be done with it. Wait, but no, I, I mean, go in how? clean with Firebase hosting. I mean, so I do ng deploy and link up Firebase hosting, get the party started. That's my my dream workflow. Yeah, uh, Adam, uh, actually, do you want to give some overview about, say, to talk a little bit about the AWS story as well? Sure. So what I didn't mention in my intro is that I am a software engineer over at AWS. We have several exciting products you might have heard of uh, for web hosting. Um, they're just getting started on the uptick in popularity. So uh, to help manage a lot of infrastructure around AWS, because AWS itself can be daunting. Of course, you can create a bucket and upload your website artifacts and click through some menus. But you know, we were talking about CI/CD before, and 
and creating really durable applications. And that's, that's not really the best way to go. Um, so, you know, in addition to what, uh, to what Netlify and Azure uh, also have capabilities to do, um, we provide a service called CloudFormation, which allows you to declare your infrastructure as code. What this means is that you can define, uh, you know, buckets, uh, ECS Fargate containers, um, you know, Lambda functions, anything you want. And we have a great tool built around this called the AWS CDK, which is a TypeScript implementation wrapped around the underlying JSON and YAML files. So you can say, side by side with your Angular application, new bucket, bucket name, uh, link to the, to the artifacts in my disk directory. And then you do something like CDK deploy, and it whisks away your artifacts and sets it up, quote unquote, the right way every time. Works for CloudFront, S3, anything you can do in CloudFormation, you can do using the CDK. And the only blocker to integrating this into ng deploy so far has been that the CDK team has been working really hard on the final steps of their version of the CI CD platform for deployments. You can string it together yourself, but again, it's about doing things the right way, uh, right out of the box. So once that's ready, um, my personal commitment on this is that uh, we're gonna build some functionality for uh, on the Amazon side, not the universal side. Um, we're gonna build some functionality, we'll build some constructs for you uh, that will say, you have an opinionated Angular structure Here's a way to create an Angular application the right way, setting up all the SPA defaults, uh, wiring up all of the, the server elements that you might need for pre-rendering uh, or, or, uh, or dynamic rendering, anything you might need. Um, so that, that's my plug for, for CDK. I think that answers the, the prompt. Maybe not. That's, that's great. And there were a lot of interesting answers also in the chat with uh, different deployment strategies. We have Firebase, Azure, AWS, S3. FTP. The, um, what I want to emphasize here is that um, when I mention all these AWS technologies, it's not to overwhelm, but more to drive home the point that there is no, and, and a point that Stephen was kind of alluding to before, there is no cookie cutter solution for an Angular universal application right now. You can have an entirely pre-rendered application in S3, that's technically a universal application. You can also have an entirely dynamic application sitting in a Fargate container that you just let run wild and hook it up to an AOB or something like that. Um, Either of those approaches work, and it's about fine-tuning uh, what your application needs to perform well, to meet your requirements, and uh, to be easily ma maintainable by your team. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, one question from me, and I guess we should have a switch to a bio break and after that move to extending Angular. Generally, uh, there are different technologies which are taking different approaches, some of them are very opinionated. They go with the entire deployment story and they can do a lot of optimizations along the way uh, because they can make certain assumptions about the application. And there are, and in Angular, for example, we are not that opinionated in terms of deployment because we believe that different approaches have their trade-offs. Generally, do you have you noticed in your practice to have ever been blocked by this lack of opinionation, for example, whether you should be using pre-rendering or server-side rendering or just client-side rendering, and what, and this lack of prescription on how you should deploy your applications. I think that's starting to be targeted at me, and maybe we can open this up. Um, in my practice, the general guidance that I give to people who just start out with Universal is don't worry about pre-rendering from the start. Unless your goal is to create a, a really nice static experience using something like Scully from the get-go, if you have an existing Angular application and you say, I want to get started with SSR, really what that means is you're going to likely use the Angular Universal schematic we've built already for either Express or Happy, um, and you'll take that schematic, what that schematic outputs 
and throw that into a, no a node server, whether that's on an EC2 host, an ECS Fargate container, or stuffing that in a Lambda. It's, you know, it, you, have to, you have to start somewhere in terms of the, the underlying technology decision and then move from there. So, you know, it's about limiting the scope of options uh, from the beginning and then changing the, changing the platform later as your needs change as well. Um, in my experience, what that means, what is the easiest for people, at least inside Amazon, to, to get over that hump is spinning up an EC2 host, which is just a raw, you know, whatever platform you want, some, you know, Linux box running somewhere that you, because it's the, it's the thing that mimics your developer environment the closest, right? It may, it may not have the easiest integration as opposed to Azure's uh, publish for SBA, but it's the easiest to say, I have this application running. I want to take this node server and put it somewhere where it'll work one-to-one. -one. And then from there, you, understand, you can then dig a little deeper into the performance, the metrics, uh, how it corresponds to other services you might need access to. And then you can say, okay, well, I don't need a full EC2 host. I don't even need a container. This is just a very simple... You know, I need some sort of dynamic field like localization or internationalization or something like that. Stuff it in there, uh, generate it at runtime, um, and then go. Uh, maybe you find out, oh, well, I can do all my internationalization at build time. Then you decide, okay, now I can move to a more pre-rendering focused format. And we're working with, uh, with Pete on improving that story as well for Universal. Um, and, and you can pare down from there, right? So it's about taking your experience, moving from the path of least resistance to the path of most selectivity, and really fine tuning from there. You don't need to start with the most performant thing every single time. That exploration. Yeah, from the Scully side, I can say we are also moving uh, to a hybrid. Uh, solution we, we are going to offer that uh, which basically means we do most of your site in SSG ser uh, server side generated and then have a couple of pods into your application that are rendered just in time by SSG or even using SSR so uh, those things will grow together uh, they they will have they have a different uh, use case and they have a different approach but in the end it's it's all what your app needs and the the, the points you you want to drive home. Where are where are you optimizing for? And what's your what is the experience of your developers? What is the experience of your DevOps team? Uh, that all comes into play if you want to go on deployment. I don't think Angular should man put any kind of thing mandatory for deployment just yet because we are by no way there that that it can be optimized for everything if ever i think that's what was what that's what was the beauty of ng deploy is that it was kind of more of like an ecosystem like uh to give you the option um that was really nice or that's what's really nice about it <laughs> yeah ng deploy knows on a number of things i think it does firebase i think it does netlify and there is Gitter pages and that will work well for a lot of applications. And uh, I think that was that was it uh, before the break. <laughs> so we have BioBray for the next, oh well, there are only six minutes, but we can extend it a little bit, right, Tracy? Yeah, let's go to the um, 35 mark, so about 10 minutes, and then we'll see you back in next conversations extending Angular. See you all soon. Okay, I, I'm not going to join that. That's not going to end well. I'm like Jessica just like showed everyone up there. Like, there's no. How did you learn? How long did it take you to learn that? Oh gosh, uh, probably like a month when I was a kid. I taught myself how to do it. <laughs> I've tried so many times and failed so many times. So I'm trying to do the four balls, right? So every day I have to do do like just the one hand doing like the. The one on its own. So then you can try and work up to doing the kind of the four ball job. 
and it's really really it's yeah. like a massive step up from three <laughs> so many angular people juggled i did not I know this trying. I keep trying. You're, you're not working them hard enough <laughs> apparently they have, they have time to do to learn things like this <laughs> Handstands and juggling. Stress I mean, release, you're Sander. halfway to a circus. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, where's the handstands? Come on, where's the handstands? Just kidding. I haven't done a handstand in a really long time, and probably no one wants to do that. <laughs> but I bet you can do some funky right. yoga moves, Jules. I can do funky yoga moves for sure. I can turn the camera upside down. <laughs> Lately, though, I've been spending time with my machete. Oh, now you're going to get yoga? Jess is going to get her sword out too. Here we go. My favorite one. <laughs> Hers is slightly longer and, and bigger. Mine's covered in mud from actually using it in dirt. But it has mud, a long mud. dirt mud. <laughs> Jeremy, did you fix your microphone or? No, looks like no, looks like <laughs> I was, was muted. Oh, okay. Um, it should be working out. The this app has a weird thing where it's like, by default, when you change your speakers, it also changes your microphone to the speakers and vice versa, and I don't know why. <laughs> so you have to unlink them in the settings, Jeremy, or did you do that already? I figured yeah, it out but eventually. what like what developer was like? This is what they want. They want their headphones to be their microphone, <laughs> like by default. <laughs> the other way around is even worse. They want their microphone to be the headphones <laughs> too. So this top needs to organize a, a blue jeans contributor days where they could discuss these. Yeah, I'm using the Linux app desktop app, and it seems we like must in so many features that. You guys all have. <laughs> Very sad. <laughs> so this is really stupid, but I my nerd brain was just amazed when I found out that basically every screen is also a camera, and every speaker is also a microphone, because like vibrations that hit your speaker actually send signal down the wire. It's just like tiny, and it's not amplified. And same with like uh, LEDs. Like shining a light on an LED, to my knowledge, creates like an electrical impedance that you can measure. So like every Every LED, every screen is a camera, and every uh, speaker is also a microphone. Really cool. That's much more for <laughs> Angular contributor nights than Angular contributor days. <laughs> <laughs> it's night over here, so I love this discussion. Oh, it's always night somewhere. On an Angular meeting. I've missed all you guys so much. It's time that we can travel again. Yeah, but it's like so nice. I mean, seriously, the GraphQL contributor days, I realized I was like, oh my gosh, this is what we're missing in our lives. You know, so I love the fact that we're able to get together. It's just so nice to see everybody and talk, like have meaningful conversations, which I feel like we've been missing this year. I don't know. Maybe y'all have been having it without me. <laughs> did you just say half meaningful? Conversations. <laughs> that sums it up. <laughs> hey, so we have two more topics. Uh, well, the first one is extending Angular. The second one is just open discussion. Again, talking about like next steps and everything like that. Um, so that'll be our last few hours. Uh, Minka, you want to kick it off? Yeah. So extending Angular. That's a very delicate topic, I'd say, uh, and very useful at the same time because that's what it, what enables the ecosystem to grow in general. And uh, we can be extending different parts of Angular. We can be extending, let's say, the framework itself by providing different APIs so that people can, uh, like different reflective APIs so people can like apply reflection and basically change the behavior of uh, individual components. Um, just just uh, an example. Uh, we are already providing very extensible, very a lot of extensibility APIs in the Angular CLI itself. You can define custom schematics, custom builders, 
In fact, many people are using the Angular CLI not only for, I, first of all, they're building a lot of uh, custom functionality on top of it, different builders and uh, different functionality for deploying uh, their apps or just like building them or custom schematics in their organizations. But also a lot of folks are using the, using the CLI in other technologies as well, not necessarily even on the JavaScript. And uh, I was also thinking about components where you could be using the different abstractions that the CDK, the component development kit provides so that you can build more rich user experiences. So there is a lot we can talk about here. I've heard folks asking for some stable compiler API so that you can extend the syntax of the framework, but this gets a little bit dangerous at a certain point uh, because uh, it kind of conflicts with a little, it kind of conflicts with the values where we want to have a single way of doing things and also opening the doors wide open sometimes you can first maintain a lot of like large API surface and uh, it's it becomes dangerous when you start composing plugins together and the APIs go get so expressive that at a certain point you're not sure what's going on. I'm sure there are a lot of such examples in the JavaScript ecosystem. So yeah, that's that was uh, the discussion around uh, this topic. And there are alternative, like clearly other, many other ways you can extend Angular by building packages around the framework. For example, Brandon Roberts recently built Angular Routing, and that's a package I really love. It's a really interesting way to way to declaratively, another way, another declarative way to declare your like routes using markup. Another example is NX. We have um, the reactive extension on top of Angular, which is NGRX. Just wanted to, to hear your thoughts on this. On generally on different approaches you would want to see or be able to exp expand on top of Angular. So I, I want to mention something uh, before we dive deep into this topic. I just want to thank you guys for allowing us to extend the render from the beginning because without this feature, we wouldn't be able, um, Patrick and Jeff and I, in, like in 2015, to create the first hack around Angular Universal. So thank you for that. And this is gonna be my pick for the extensibility, uh, being able to really um, hack around the render and you know create whatever rendering platform you want. I also want to uh, share stuff. What I <clears throat> what I like on extending Angular is um, even if it is not well documented, but if you want to hook into some essential things like error handling, routing, event listeners, and so on, everywhere under the hood there is the custom event manager. There is the HTTP factory. There is so much stuff. Um, that you can just take, extend with like two, three lines of code and completely change the way how Angular is running, like nearly completely, and it does not break stuff. And I cannot stress enough how amazing <laughs> this is. And I wanted to ask if we can document that more, that stuff that is possible. Um, giving real life examples. I know that uh, Alex Inc was creating a very nice custom event manager where you could like do passive events or out zone events or whatever. A lot of people try to dispatch the HTTP requests from zone, which is uh, either you use zone flags, but then you don't have granularity and you cannot just turn off zone. It will never work, forget it, right? So we need granular way to introduce changes and those those services, undocumented services, are incredibly powerful to do fine-grained changes and be very safe in, in, in introducing the changes. I, yeah, just want to stress out that this is really amazing. And I think it's a good, good moment to kind of highlight that, that, that this magic is possible, like, thanks to DI that, like, Angular has, and, like, it's still kind of pretty unique, and, and I feel like we are not maybe, maybe like, there's sometimes controversy people saying, oh, why, why are you even need DI in the travel factor, right? Like, I mean, Angular is the only one that has it. Uh, but, but like, here's the testimony, like, exactly why, why it's nice to have it, right? Like, because we introduced those flex points on so many various ways. And, uh, yeah, I, I feel like 
I, I need to cover this message more because that that's pretty amazing machine learning. Yes. Yeah, I think the the power of the Angular dependency injection system is that great that internal Basel built this internationalization solution, which is translocal. And it was very easy to create different like, transpiders for that because you just replace the injection token with a new implementation. And it's, it's all down to the Angular dependency injection that that's possible, which is incredible for extending Angular to be fair. I think the only area where you cannot expand Angular is in the template syntax. And for that, we need, probably need to open the compiler a little bit. And that is something I really would like. But at the same time, it's something I really would hate to see in most hands. And I probably don't have to explain that. <laughs> but it is, uh, it is something that, that would be amazing to be available. Because if that is there, I can extend uh, for my clients and for myself Angular to the ways I really like like fully observable without, without having the team, having to, the team to add that. Add that. There was a similar discussion in the TC39, should they allow operator overloading? And they decided they shouldn't. Uh, yeah, it's a very interesting trade-off there. In Haskell, for example, we have you can overwrite everything. And yeah, there. I don't think that's the reason why Haskell doesn't have much larger adoption, but it definitely creates more harder to read constructs. Yeah. Same goes for it... Ruby, I think. Yeah. And I don't know if this is a, like worth talking about more deeply, but like that's something where like I actually don't see us ever doing that, right? Like ever giving like customizing template syntax like that. Because part of the whole value proposition of Angular. And one of the reasons why I invested in it is for the consistency, right? If you are using Angular in one company or one part of a company, you jump to another company or um, another part of the company, another team, you are using the same stuff for the most part. And if you get in the business of customizing the template syntax, then you are suddenly in like a completely different world, like potentially every time you move between projects and it stops becoming like you, you, it stops becoming like a unified framework at that point and just becomes a tool, set of tools for building a framework or starts moving in that direction. Yeah, but I, I, even though we would never do it or try to support it, I just love the idea of someone building a compiler, like build an alternative compiler that follows your paradigms and your like your mental model and then compiles our, our instruction set. Like I, I don't want to support it, but I want someone to do that so that we can learn from it and make, make ourselves better. <laughs> Stephen, do you remember the Twig days? <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, I remember, I remember, I remember twig. twig. So like that's a, this is one of the interesting things about Ivy, isn't it? That um, we're providing an instruction set, and obviously we're terrified of actually letting anyone rely upon that at this moment. Um, but you know, there's always like little back chats here and there about how potentially you could build your own compiler that can com that compile down to this. Uh, um, by the instruction set. One thing I was going to say, by the way, with direct in terms of um, dependency injection with Ivy, is that actually Ivy has gone in some way slightly away from dependency injection because the internal renderer is is totally independent from a dependency injection. It doesn't. It's not aware of it. So there's actually some in, some interesting internal tension there um, when you're trying to pass information that's available to the dependency injector across to Ivy, um, which is led to some interesting decision making. Yeah, yeah so uh, design to, choices. Uh, to expand a little bit on the rendering instructions, imagine if uh, the compiler, if we just make the parsing API stable, that's something that I've been, well, <laughs> I was trying to do for probably <laughs> seven years now, uh, or I don't know, a, a while. And uh, I've been broken by the Angular compiler a few times, so I've rewritten my side project. That's fine. Uh, I understand it's clearly not a stable API. Now I understand it even better. <laughs> but um, imagine if it becomes stable and we can just leave the transformation step to, to developers to, to build the transformation step from AST to ID instructions. Can we submit a petition to have this? <laughs> 
Can you start the petition so to have this feature? <laughs> So, so like <laughs> before doing this, I think that there is like interesting discussions of like what is like primary motivation, like why people want to hack, right? Like because on one hand, like Jeremy had like extremely valid point, which I would like to have from the enterprise point of view, that like if you've got one uh, template syntax, you've got consistent experience across the applications, you know, like whatever, and you've got like thousands of developers, and like each team will have consistent experience. Like as soon as we've got different compilers this goes out of the window and like, you know, the team next to you will have. Uh, so, so what I'm trying to say is like, maybe sometimes the motivation is that like people not hate the syntax or, uh, but maybe they are missing one particular feature or maybe like, I, I think that the reactivity is kind of good example here, right? Like, and, and uh, Minko mentioned that there is one of the highest voted issues, but in fact, when you look at the issue tracker, there's this whole cluster uh, of, uh, of issues kind of connected with how you consume and interact with the reactive streams. Uh, so the question is like, do people really want to create like, you know, syntax for everyone or do that I trying to, to tackle very specific issues? And like, I, I don't know how to, how to kind of, you know, surface this information, but I guess what we are missing partly is, um, yeah. This kind of collaboration from the popular libraries or extensions and so on, say like, you know, I'm missing the flex points here. And based on this, we could make a decision it's like, oh, we are actually, we can open up certain APIs in the framework to kind of, uh, to give you yes. this access. Or that's kind of completely crazy what we are trying to do. Like we won't support you, but here is your this, you know, like some backdoor where you can plug into. Uh, but I feel like we, we kind of lacking this distinction It's like, what is the the issue that I'm trying to solve versus I want to completely build a new framework on top of the IP instructions, right? Yeah, with the parsing API, my point there was just to allow, like you're keeping the syntax since the parser is the same. Um, you allow different, you open the door for more tools for static analysis and pod generation. I guess this is a little bit of a niche case. If you look at, if you look on NPM, there are probably 20 or like 30 such projects. About extending the syntax, I agree. And generally, I think there is a big trend towards development experience. Many people want to just have more expressive syntax. And it's about, I would say 95% is about syntax, not semantics. I've heard in the past, like a lot, I mean, a lot, not a couple of folks, they wanted to, they wanted Angular to support the JSX syntax, I mean, template. And I mean, I'm taking the risk here by saying that probably if we open the these features, this API, they would probably be useful. I, I don't know, like making numbers here by 10% of the developers. Um, is that yeah, worth it? <laughs> it's something actually we've investigated. Um, Mishko um, has been, he spent a lot of time like researching this. Um, so basically the, the context there is like there, we have another, uh, there's another web framework that exists inside of Google. I think we may have talked about before and the research was centered around like, could we unify on a single templating system for like this internal thing for Angular and for um, like, so to unify how people are writing templates at Google and JSX was obviously one of the considerations. And the ultimate conclusion of that is that like JSX just does not work super well for Angular um, because the the, the, the way Mishko would explain is like, is like the mental model for like what a template represents is different in Angular versus um, in JSX. Pavel can probably talk about this in a more educated way. <laughs> no, but like I mean, even with without going into mental models, I think like like. If you compare expressiveness of the uh, GSX today and like Angular templates, there are certain things that you cannot easily express in GSX. Like I mean, we like the the, the primary example would be like directives. Right? Like we've got directives. This is not a thing in the uh, in, in GSX. So and obviously you can bridge those things. You can try to uh, you know I will use this attribute or something. Right. The, the other thing that you don't have in JSX is the t distinction between like property binding and attribute binding and so on and so on. Um, so I, I don't want to enumerate all those things. I'm just saying like currently today, uh, Angular templates are more expressive than JSX uh, for 
like good or bad reasons, but like that that's the reality on the ground. I can tell you my reason why I want to open up template syntax. Um, what I'm missing in Angular is support for observables. That's apparently not a secret that I'm missing that. And it would be so lovely if I could add so a little bit of syntax to the to the template so I could have like observable user events. So instead of, I don't know, instead of round brackets, use curly brackets for, and I get an, uh, a subject or something like that instead of a um, uh, click handler. And right, that would be my my main thing, and there are a couple of more things that are around observables, but they it pretty much boils down to to that. That is my my main use case for this. And, and that's kind of what I was getting at, because like I, I feel yeah. like many people are saying like, oh, I want to have completely different compiler, but like in the end, what they are saying, like part of the story is like, oh, I want to have kind of native, right. for the lack of the better word, like a built-in support for uh, for observables so, like you can see like I, mean, I think i mentioned spelt and like and because they, they kind of built on top of the reactive streams not using rxjs but like at the heart it's kind of reactive model uh, and they've got specific syntax for consuming uh, those streams and we, we you could argue that we also have it right like with the uh, with the asic pipe that, that's kind of a specific syntax but like obviously we see that it's not enough uh, yeah, so, yeah, maybe the ASIC should... pipes in. You need something out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I'm saying, like it's kind of you know like yeah. part of the story. Uh, uh, so so maybe somehow before saying like we need complete freedom in writing like templates. Maybe what we need really is just to focus on the like the needs, right? Like we were saying, like what's the what there is in, in there for me? Like why you would like to. Uh, have this new syntax, like what, what is missing somehow. And also something that I would like to have uh, available in Angular to me is um, the same type, the same thing as Angular decorators. Those are compile time. I want to have like a, I want to be able to make those compile time decorators too. So I can do the same things Angular is doing. Uh, runtime decorators are just not suitable for a lot of use cases. What just by proxy, adding the, uh, sorry, extending sorry. the Angular CLI with a uh, custom builder and adding your Webpack plugin that transforms decorators with something like Babel or like a Babel plugin might allow you to do that without touching the Angular compiler. Yeah, that's what I was about to say is that um... I don't think there's anything Angular specific about that. I think you can write a TypeScript plugin or like a Babel plugin that could do that today, no? Yeah, but a little bit more streamlined and, and a little bit more easier to hook into in the Angular uh, metadata that is available during build time would be nice. And that is actually where I'm asking for, not for building a, a decorator build time. I can do that indeed with TypeScript and I have done that before. But what you're missing if you're doing that is the connection with Angular. You can you can build something next to Angular while you want to build to build in conjunction with Angular because you want to extend something that Angular is already giving and you don't have access to it. It's it's also really hard. To, uh, mm -hmm. I love Ivy, but I don't like Bloom filters that much. So. Yeah, messing manually with the boom filters probably it's not what you want to do. I know what you mean. <laughs> Can I quickly jump in here, Sender? <clears throat> you mm -hmm. ask for some reactive features. I spent a little bit of time on that, and I look at this question from from two sides. Uh, what events do I get from my user interface, and what data do I want to display in my user interface? These are the two ways, and uh, you already mentioned you want to have template syntax, like button clicks as a stream. Uh, I use subjects all the time for that as a workaround, but it is not my biggest. Uh, it was not my biggest interest to go from from this side because everybody can easily just create a subject, an event emitter, an Angular default event emitter, and, and use it there, and you have some push based some. Uh, a reactive or, or even just promise like thing from the template. The other stuff that is way more interesting is how you 
put the data into the template. Um, and at the moment, Angular puts the data in the template by, uh, well, re-evaluating the templates. You, you link the values and then Angular has to do stuff and re-evaluate the template, the template expressions and update snippets of HTML to display that. Um, and we created the same set of directives that you know now, like ng-if, ng-4, ng-switch, and also this uh, ng-let directive. There is a huge issue in in the Angular GitHub, uh, hundreds of likes for something like, like uh, that replaces the ng-if hack with the async pipe. So we have those things running. Um, I was investigating it uh, by replacing it with some uh, custom compiler thing. My outcome on that topic was nobody will ever put that stuff in their production app. At least every single company that was uh, that I was explaining that stuff to them or which were from their own interest experimenting with that technology <clears throat> gave a somehow positive signal of using custom compilers in any of their production apps. This is what, what my feedback was. So <clears throat> I went for directives to implement that stuff, the directivity. Um, you can, you should have a look, it's pretty interesting. Uh, last point that I want to mention and then I stop talking. Uh, I experimented a lot of uh, time with how we render stuff, uh, especially fancy shit like uh, React concurrent mode, post task scheduler, like those shiny new things that will land sometime in Chrome and will maybe make a big change or not. I had no clue uh, what it will do. Now we basically implemented the post task scheduler stable in that directives, also the React scheduler and any other scheduler you want to use is now replaceable. And we built it in a way that you can drop that stuff into a default Angular application and in the next months, um, maybe I can share a huge Angular application that is using those directives and they already benefit incredibly from it. So we made progress that is really outstanding. Is there a place how I can discuss those topics with people that are interested in those things? Because I believe, I believe it's really it's something, really something uh, uh, pretty cool, a very innovative thing and I'm Pretty sure we have like outstanding uh, knowledge on that and we want to share that with people that are really interested and want to contribute on that knowledge. Just want to second that. Yeah, I can encourage you to, uh, to chat with Michael. He's doing pretty cool stuff uh, around change detection and optimizing in different ways. So if you're looking for a side project, that's it. I would love to uh, make another perspective on extending Angular. So, huge toolbox, and when you extend it, it's getting much, much bigger. And I would love to customize uh, Angular more. So, when you, because uh, when you install Angular, you have even with the minimal setup around 380 megabytes, um, and you don't need all the tools for just uh, the uh, basic app. And when I'm still dreaming of the situation when I'm sitting in a train with low connect internet connection and uh, being able to uh, set up an Angular project um, from scratch. And uh, sometimes I would love to have uh, really Angular in, uh, better, um, in smaller packages which you can customize and install uh, on the, uh, when you need it, and not uh, not initially everything. In this case, I would uh, love to also sometimes discuss pending Angular. Do you understand what I mean? So kind of a, a follow-up question I would have on that is what features of Angular would you not want to have there? Um, because I know like there's there's been some looking into things like, oh, well, if you don't use dependency injection, we can make it so that you don't pay for that. Or if you don't use like text interpolations, you won't pay for that. But the majority of the time I see applications, right? Like it, it's hard to find an application that does exist without using dependency injection, right? Like even ng4 uses dependency injection or things like that. And so um, I, I'm interested to hear like what specific features uh, would you expect from a more minimal version? So just for uh, 
example, when I'm uh, selling, uh, when I create an application and I'm asked, oh, Robert, uh, do you want to uh, have a router or not? Um, and I take the option, no, I don't, don't want to take the router because maybe I don't need it. Um, the, uh, the application is still the same. And uh, <coughs> if you don't need uh, some internet, internet, internet initialization features or whatever. So when I uh, install Angular, I have to uh, hold, uh, the whole toolbox. And um, it's not just about interpolation or dependency injection. Uh, I think Angular is much bigger. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not uh, these parts which are um, uh, incre increasing the size. I, I don't think it's the parts of Angular that are increasing the size. It's the, the, the fact that we don't really have granular lazy loading. You cannot lazy load parts of Angular. Basically, what that means is if somewhere in your application you're using an exotic part of Angular, it is going to your main.js. And I understand <coughs> why that why that happens. At the same time, I wished it wasn't so that I just could lazy load a part of Angular on the moment I need it. Uh, I mean, um, that's, that's possible to some extent today. There's um, there's third-party libraries that enable it a little bit easily. Like, um, it's not very ergonomic for sure. Um, the framework doesn't make it easy for you to do that. Um, and it's some, yeah. it's one of the things in our backlog to to tackle, but. Um, it is within the realm of possibility, at least. I, I know that, but it, I was talking about the ergonomics around this because yeah. it is really hard to do. I looked into iSpec, I looked into a couple of other things, but uh, or even not bundling at all, which would, which I would prefer during development, but it's simply not not possible right now. Mm -hmm. I would I would actually uh, try and answer Jeremy's initial question by asking a different question. If I if I were to have something like Angular JS built with Angular, what are the pieces that need to be taken down from Angular currently? Like if you want to run Angular directly from the browser, and I know that's a different topic, <laughs> but uh, I think things that need compilation and transpilation probably have a lot of stuff to do here. Uh, someone saying something? I was going to just yeah. say that um, it is possible to run uh, Angular directly from JavaScript without the compilation step. You the, the, the main problem at the moment is that it's a, difficult to write the decorators if you're not using Java, uh, TypeScript. But assuming that you can generate JavaScript which contains the right properties, then um, you can do all of the Angular compilation in the browser using the JIT compiler, which would effectively give you a lot of what you're talking about in terms of getting back to our Angular JS source. And this is kind of how some of these online, um, uh, not code pen, but similar kind of products work. Um, we often like libraries will publish a UMD bundle and then you can consume that directly in the browser. I'm wondering though, uh, going back to what um, uh, Robert was saying at the beginning, I wonder if there needs to be a, a, a separation here between the developer's experience of how much you need and the actual production uh, cost. Because I thought that what Robert was talking about sounded more like when I'm installing an Angular app, it's massive and I'm downloading all this stuff. And that's all mostly to do with the CLI, right? Whereas then lots of the responses to him were to do with what gets pushed to the browser at build, like at um, distribution time. And I think that those are two different issues that should be addressed separately. And I do believe that the CLI team are currently in the process of trying to slim down their dependencies so that they can pull down a, a smaller set of NPM bundles. That's what, what, what we're talking about, the developer experience, just when you start um, creating an application. 
And it is true that, you know, currently when you create a new Angular project, the node modules contains like 100 or 200 megabytes of uh, JavaScript and other bits and pieces, which always does seem completely over the top. And so it would be interesting if there was some kind of CLI light mode where you were able to uh, somehow get the minimum uh, installation just to get a project that you could build and execute. Exactly. Maybe under a uh, hundred meg. 377, I looked. <laughs> uh, so, like for example, Next.js, you see uh, how fast it can go. And uh, this is a totally different experience. You just install it, start it, and uh, are happy. And when I had a, a slow internet connection uh, um, ago, a while ago, it was taking minutes, uh, whatever, to just set up an Angular project. On the topic of the CLI, um, there's a little bit in chat about it, and I'm going to link in uh, a comment. Uh, we did just uh, land Tailwind support, so this is an extension to post CSS for the CLI. Uh, we had a survey on this recently, and, and so, now so now there's a decision on there's Tailwind. Decision. There's also a decision in there on Purge CSS, which was the number two most popular. The other decision that was made was that going forward, we're not going to expose the whole plugin ecosystem of PostCSS because of just the difficulty of supporting that. But as people want to, you know, vote up or get support behind any certain plugin, um, the team is willing to look at uh, those popular plugins and, and start to integrate them. I think the other thing that's also happening is I was told that the preset EMV plugin was another one that the team is, is looking at as well. So if you're interested in any other post CSS plugins, um, you can open an issue and start a discussion on that and try to gather support. It's uh, interesting to point out also how we added the support there. We don't actually depend on the plugin. We just consider it as an optional peer dependency. So if you add it to your project, you're going to have Tailwind. Otherwise, well, you're not going to have Tailwind, and that's fine with the Angular CLI. So if if this if Tailwind gets replaced by something else in the future, we wouldn't have to do a large migration step or like drop support or it's just a very lightweight dependency we can link quickly at runtime. Um, I, I had another question. Uh, I don't know if it's related to extensibility, but it's um, related to the mobile world. So what is actually the current status of the Angular on mobile? And by, and by this, I mean natively. Like, I know there's native script, but is, there the, is this the only solution, or are, are you exploring other options? Mark probably can chime in here. Or I can chime in here. Yeah, I had a, I had a French fry. I was mid French fry when you asked your question, Watson. Uh, so for mobile, so if you're looking for your native mobile experience where you can't really tell that it's web technology running it, native script is your solution, right? So that's where you're going to have to go. But but if you want, we got two other options that I that we I recently just explored actually. One is doing a PWA. Right, so your progressive web app, when those can be installed on your phone, which you know that, right? You can already install these on your phone. And if your CSS and web tech stuff is really good and clean, the user's going to have a really good experience. But you may say, but what about all the native APIs? I want to get native APIs. That's true. So, so that is a limitation. So what you do in that case, uh, Capacitor is actually a nice wrapper that you can put around your Angular application. But in these hybrid situations, right? you're always going to run into the, 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 the UI thing, right? If you want 60 frames per second, like no jank in your animation. So, because that's what users kind of determine between like the quality, right? They see animation jank or drop frames, that type of stuff kind of like, you know, uh, disillusions users. So if you're worried about that type of stuff, then you go with something like a native script so you can use your Angular code. But, but 
I still say that as the web browsers, especially on mobile, get more and more powerful, you can get a, you can get a lot done with something like uh, Capacitor, and if you you know, and then using Material or Ionic on mobile, you can get a lot done that way. That's the that's what your current options kind of are. Unless I missed something, somebody else want to jump in, but I think that's kind of your three pathways. Yeah, I just I just didn't um, wanted to make sure that there were no other options actually to build native apps other than native script for Angular. If it helps, I second uh, Capacitor and Angular together. Yeah, yeah, I don't think there's any other like... options. It, it always comes down to what what are you trying to solve, right? Because like even if you look at React Native, the the APIs and the way that you have to implement your application to support web and mobile is painful. So then if you're just building a mobile application, Angular might not be the best way to do that today. But if you're trying to support a cross-platform application and you want code sharing, then that, that drives you closer to something like a native script or a capacitor for more code sharing. But then I mean, we all know that any sort of hybrid approach has its own drawbacks and limitations because you've got the greatest common denominator problem. I mean, there, there's really good solutions here, but Oftentimes what we see is that people are asking for something when they, they don't even know what they're asking for because they like they don't understand the space, which is a really hard problem for us because they're like, I want it. where's Angular's React Native? And we're like, well, what, are you, what problem are you trying to solve? Yeah, and I will say that um, on our side, right, for like the, the Angular team at Google, I don't think we have plans to ever pursue any kind of native mobile development. It's just... Honestly, it's not our wheelhouse. Um, our expertise is in building stuff for the web. And so any mobile stuff that we focus on is gonna be focused on like service workers and PWAs, um, things like that. And there's always space in the community to work on you know, native stuff, but it's, it's just not our area of expertise. Um, that, that sounds great. I mean, I'm a progressive web app advocate at heart, so I'm fine with that. I'm just like hearing clients, um, like in the past when it was consulting, like they wanted native because they they think it's faster than web. Um, and when it comes to building native with web technologies, I mean, React Native is probably the, one of the but most, if, like the top choices there. But, but, but even there, if, if you really want a well, op if you want a native app, you should actually be writing Kotlin and Swift, right? Like an, a well-optimized Kotlin and Swift application. Any they other layer, you're going app. through a VM. <laughs> they want it for cheap. <laughs> if anyone well, is familiar... I, I, sorry, go ahead, please. If anyone's familiar with um, the My Disney Experience app, uh, without going into a whole lot of detail, it's mostly a native app, but the last modification that we made to it about a year ago was Angular, and it's a hybrid kind of mishmash. And as far as I can tell, nobody can tell the difference. Yeah. Um, like, I think that there's enough evidence out there now that PWAs are just as good as native apps for a lot of use cases. So, for example, like, Twitter has, like, the flagship example here. The, the Twitter PWA is, in my mind, like, better than their... Um, their native application. It's just like, it's fast, works great, works just like a native app. Um, Wait, can you, can you edit your images there? I don't know. <laughs> you can't edit your images, I think. I mean, last time I checked. I think that's the only reason I still keep the native Twitter app on my phone. Me too, yeah. yeah looking at something like Smoosh, the Chrome, the application that Chrome built, you should be able to edit images as well. I think they're running some encoders in WebAssembly somewhere, somehow. Yeah, yeah, I'm not but saying, yeah, you, I'm not saying I mean, you, you can you do can. it. I mean, you can do yes. it, obviously. Yeah. It's just like yeah, there we, are some limitations maybe somewhere that... Yeah, we all love web, the web here. That was the wrong uh, group of people to discuss native apps. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we are right around the time to start discussing just uh, anything we want to. <laughs> we are no longer we no longer have to stick to the agenda. Although we were in this phase for a while now talking about uh, um, just uh, different platforms. 
and and I, I'll say I I asked for this time to be added at the end because um, with past contributor days and past events like this, we had a lot of really really good discussions. But then the question is, where do we go from here, right? Like, is it all, we all had some good ideas and now we all go back and do the exact same thing we were doing before. Um, and so ideally, um, we would come up with what are the concrete next steps that the community's doing that uh, you're asking the team to do, uh, or ideas that we have, best practices, recommendations, all those sorts of things. Um, and ideally we'd get to like, I don't know, a little Google doc that we all edited and said, hey, here's, here's the summary of what we learned, here's what we figured out. And, uh, all the people that are going to go out and build Angular Native get together and have a little group to go do that. <laughs> so can I ask a question related to tooling? Um, I'm curious about plans. Um, for example, in React, it is, as far as I know, pretty easy to analyze time between routing, bootstrap time, and so on and so forth with timing marks in the flame chart side. As far as I know, I just bootstrap that thing with some comment and pop, I will have all the timing marks there and I can just measure it. Um, of course, this is not really complicated and I can easily and with not really a lot of effort implement it in an application, but I would love to see some some things implemented, I don't know, in the compile process or somewhere else that sets all the small, or in, at least let me configure or, or enable all those small timing marks in my application. And then I can just navigate to any Angular app that has that enabled and just run my measurements, like maximum navigation time, time to bootstrap a component, time to lifecycle hook number, whatever. Is that somehow uh, a cool idea, you believe, Angular team? <laughs> You know, what? Um, one of the uh, things going forwards, I think, is to improve the debugging uh, APIs that we have in the uh, in the <coughs> core. Um, at the moment, we've been implementing some things in Ivy, so that because obviously the internal Ivy structures are really non-human friendly. Uh, so recently, we've dropped in some nice uh, development mode. Um, properties that you can then use to see these things in a much more sort of readable way. I would imagine that this kind of thing is is in that same realm. I'm not saying whether or not uh, I'm looking at Jeremy to see if he starts staring at me, whether or not this would be a good idea. I think it sounds like a great idea, but it seems to fit in that kind of mode of debug things that you could add in developer mode, which then disappear in real apps or in production time. Yeah, we've talked about some advanced debugging, debugging APIs that allow you to, they're on by default in dev mode, and you can lazy load them uh, so that they can patch the internal data structures and provide such debugging capabilities in prod as well. It's a, there is a project proposal, but maybe not on top of the roadmap at this point, yeah. Could you link the project? Is it publicly available? I just like similar APIs to what you currently have attached to the global NG object, but like more of them, so that uh, they can provide more insights to the internals. But still, it's uh, not even in the design stage. It's just a project, like one pager. Cool. There is another thing that you can use to debug performance in Angular, which is this cool tool, I guess you created at Minko to just high frequently run change detection when I navigate to a page and then I see how much ticks I can manage to get, get. in a particular, in amount, a particular of time. amount of time. Um, uh, it is cool. Yeah. It's cool. We'll be we working on DevTools actually. Yeah, DevTools would be something that would allow more digestible view to uh, your change detection cycles and how much time you spent in in code, in, in lifecycle hooks, in particular outputs and templates. Very happy to hear that. I'm May curious. I add something? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Um, so I was, I was thinking like, uh, what would be the steps to, to make, um, Angular more 
progressive. And what I mean by that is that I've been dreaming of like this Angular component in one TypeScript file that I can just compile with TSC, you know, just TSC my components and just get it to work. And, and then from there, starts with one component and then enable Angular features on top of that, you know, like making Angular more accessible from the beginning. Then you can add modules if you want. You can add um, zones if you want. You can add um, dependency injection. I don't know if we can make that optional, but you know, uh, is there something we can do about that? Is there, is it in the path or is it in the roadmap? Is it something we can, uh, we can think about or would that make sense? Well, something we do want to pursue is making ng modules optional. That, that is a, like a super clear thing that a lot of people want. And the thing that you need in order to make that work is some way for components to import components that they're using. Because um, that currently, the ng module, of the two responsibilities it serves, that's one of them, is saying like, for given component X, what are the other components and directives and whatnot that have available to it? And so, uh, you need some way to say, oh, I'm, you know, user profile component and I'm consuming, you know, text field, button, checkbox, whatever. Um, and then the, uh, the other half of the ng module thing is a, there would need to be an alternate way of configuring the dependency injector or just not using dependency injection. Um, and that is like one aspect of what you're you're asking about um another aspect um that we have in our backlog that we are um, you know that we're thinking about is making ngs or making zones optional right um which is particularly important to us since the issues that zone has with native async await and now that pe more people are wanting to move to like es 2017 plus emit and again it's something that it's it's something we're thinking about and trying to figure out how to get to zones. Um, so I think I, there are aspects of what you're you're asking about that are definitely in the front of our mind and that we're thinking about how to do. Um, we I don't think we think of it as a like making it so that like there's a more like minimal version of Angular or anything like that, but it's more about like this is an area that is either confusing or hard to learn or more complex than it needs to be and we'll like focus on this particular area make it either more flexible or easier to use and then focus on a different area and hopefully over time it moves to something that is more i don't know consumable bite sizable I, I would say it's it's nowhere in our roadmap to get rid of ngc like the the idea of just starting with a typescript file like I, I love the idea that's that's kind of part of the magic of AngularJS, but our compiler was written from the ground up with this assumption that it's run at build time, not at runtime. Right? Like we would need to design a different compiler entirely for that to happen. But I don't see that one ending up on the roadmap. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's something that that we can't be clear on is that like Angular is built around the idea that your your templates are compiled into code and you need the Angular to compiler to do that. And I don't see like any any future where that isn't the case. Oh, but isn't isn't there? I, I don't remember exactly, but isn't there something in a roadmap about like uh, uh, bringing NGC as an um, extension to TSC? Or am I am I getting it? Yeah, wrong? it is. Um, it is a plugin into TSC. So um, that's really just more of an implementation detail than anything. Um, Previously, um, maybe this is getting too, too into the weeds. Somebody stop me if I'm going too deep. But um, before Ivy, uh, NGC was into, implemented as just a standalone program, and that had some limitations. That's why Angular had to produce like ng factory files, because there wasn't really a well-supported way for us to hook into the TypeScript compilation in order to modify the output of what TypeScript was emitting. And so basically we would like look at TypeScript sources and also emit um, or look at what TypeScript produced and emit um, the compiled code that Angular did and it had to be in a separate file. By changing that implementation such that NGC is implemented as a TypeScript plugin, we can hook into that TypeScript compilation unit and alter the emit of the output of what TypeScript is producing. And that's why with Ivy, the generated code is outputted into the same files as the JavaScript that's being emitted for your component, right? So you have like your, again, your user profile component, 
all of the generated code for that lives in the same like user profile.js output as like static class properties. Um, so you do get some benefits of it being from a TypeScript plugin, but it's still like, it is still running the Angular compiler, right? It's parsing your templates and generating code for them. It's just that the implementation details are a bit different. Okay, cool. That's good to know. Thanks. And and then there's also uh, concerning like um, modulus Angular or making modules optional. Um, uh, I, if I remember well, like, a few years ago, like there was a, a PR from Minko with, who added, I don't know if you remember Minko, like the adding the depth property in the component definition. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, I think it was pre IV. Would that make sense today yes. with IV? Would that be easy, hardcore to integrate? Because personally, I'm a, I'm a, I, I mainly use, uh, what I call spams, which is like a mix of, uh, what, Lars, who's here, I guess. Yeah, hey, here he is. Uh, calls scam plus uh, single file components. And I have like one module per, per components and I'd love just to have like a depths, uh, or imports in the component declaration. How far would it be, would it be, would we be from that? No, it's, it's actually funny that you say that because that was how Angular worked, Angular worked before, before we introduced, we introduced Angular modules back in Alpha. Back yeah. And uh, I can talk a little bit about this PR as well. So I, um, the, the implications are that, that's that's kind of a fundamental change which needs to be planned really well. And this is on our roadmap. We have optional ng modules, and they would probably function in somehow similar way, but we haven't finalized the design yet. But this is definitely on the roadmap. It's uh, something that would simplify. I'll say the mental overhead, the conceptual overhead when you're getting started with Angular. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, that's something uh, we're looking at. I will at. say one thing, one thing we are thinking about is um, you mentioned like having a component declare what it imports in its component decorator. Um, that is how it had been implemented in the past before ng modules existed. In the future, one of the options we're looking at is actually having a, uh, an import statement live in the template because that moves like it is moving closer to acknowledging that your like templates are really code and they are participating in the javascript module system and having imports in your template would also make it easier for the um the angular compiler to do like less global like it makes local compilations easier right Misho is always complaining about how hard it is to uh, make selectors work in angular and having imports live in your template instead of like in the supporting code um, would be one possible way to kind of simplify that. All right, so I, I think we're we're running down the the clock here, so. Um, I do want to take a chance and see if there are next steps or collaborations that we can create as part of this group, because um, I, I really just think that that's the way to create or to keep the, the value going beyond this conversation. So um, what what next steps do people want to see or try or think more about or follow up on conversations on? I would love to hear about people that are interested in this reactive part that uh, Senda was mentioning, and uh, I, we have some code examples. so. Would be cool to have some place to go and chat to other interests. Okay. Michael, yeah. do you wanna do you wanna host that maybe like a week from now? We we find a time and anyone that wants to join can join a hangout or something? Perfect. Sounds like a plan, I would say. I will All ping right. you in Slack on how to do this. Uh so here, why don't we here? I'm gonna share a doc. It's empty. Mm -hmm. So uh just be aware, and everyone's going to be an editor. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can set a date, so scheduling things is like one of the hardest things that humans do. So I'm just going to pick a date and a time. Uh, apparently, 11 a.m. works for all of us. So I'm going to say on the 11th at 11 a.m., we're going to have this call.
Great. And anyone that wants to join, just pop your email in. I'll also make a little list, invitees. I'll add myself. So uh, everyone's got the, the document. There's going to be a conversation about uh, Reactive Angular. If you want to come to that, let's let's have another conversation next week. What what other conversations should we have? The other one that's already started up in the chat was the docs and <laughs> contributing resources and maintaining those. Uh, Dave said he was going to organize something in Slack along with GDEs and contributors. I, I think one of the problems is uh, not everyone here is a GDE, so I want to make sure we have an inclusive, like, open group. Um, is Dave still here? Dave is still here. Dave, when, when do you want to run a, a session on that? Um, that's a great question. Uh, this is, this is obviously, uh, like, first of all, I have to say, like, I'm thrilled. Like, I have worked on many different projects, and I never get to hear a bunch of people say, like, how can we help with the docs? So, um, I'm, I'm so excited, I almost don't know what to do with myself. Um, which is actually a default state for me, now that I think about it. Um, yeah, I'm happy to have a conversation, uh, you know, and, and get the ball rolling on this when, uh, whenever it works. So um, I can, I'm not as good at multitasking as you are, Stephen, but I can put together a doc and have people uh, uh, sign up if they're interested. And I don't, I love our GDEs. I love everybody who uses Angular. So, you know, I don't, you know, I'm happy to work with uh, anyone who wants to help out. Do you, do you want to just propose a time? Because like the, I didn't think it would be this successful. We already have like 50, like 10 people signed up for the other chat. So if you want to just pick a time, people are ready to sign up. I'm going to pick a time. Um, you said 11 o'clock seems to work well for a lot of folks. Um, you already claimed the 11th, didn't you? So I did. I'll claim the the 18th. Okay, February 18th. Yep. All right, and uh, you're hosting that one? Yeah, I'll host it. Sorry, I have a very cranky dog over here if you're hearing him. So. Awesome. What what other conversations uh, should we have? We, we talked a lot about, oh, go ahead, Yana. I'd love, I'd love to talk about uh, harnesses. <laughs> Uh, I, I've been working a bit with, on Cypress, on uh, harnesses supports on Cypress and stuff like that. And personally, from the feedback I get from the people to whom I present harnesses, is that using harnesses sounds pretty uh, straightforward, but creating harnesses uh, isn't that straightforward for most people. Um, I don't know if I'm missing something while explaining how to implement harnesses or if there is something we can do around harnesses to make them easier to implement. Uh, but I'd love to discuss that with anyone. Uh, I mean, for that, um, I'm happy to just take any feedback about that, right? Um, this is like the, the harnesses are something where it's so like, boy, I mean, 2020 went by in a flash. I want to say it's relatively new, but like... <laughs> Um, we are very open to feedback on how to make the harnesses easier. Um, so like even just filing it, feedback in like a GitHub issue or just like sending it to me on Slack is a good starting point. Um, let's see, do I have anything else? Uh, yeah, definitely like anything we can do with like more docs and examples. One of the things we did recently is we um, made it so that we could have stack blitz examples for harnesses. Um, and we started adding those to our doc site. And so I could see doing more of that for creating harnesses as well. Mm. Yeah, that, that sounds interesting. But the thing is that I already opened like a, a big issue with lots of topics. And I was just thinking like if we were like a bunch of people working on that, that could be like live discussing it, it could be faster than async. Communication, but yeah, I don't know, or the, otherwise, I'm, I'm just gonna try to find out the link and share it here. So if anyone, anybody else wants to join the issue. Yeah, Eunice, when, when are you gonna run a, a follow-up conversation about harnesses so that everyone can talk about it? What? Sorry. 
when are you going to run a follow up conversation so that we, we people that are interested can talk and contribute? Yeah, I'd love, I can do that. <laughs> so p p put in the little doc I've got when when you're going to run that, and then people will sign up. Okay, cool. Let's mm, uh, let's put that um, the twenty fifth. Cool. Can can I uh, propose a short idea about uh, the Google Docs? Um, so maybe, uh, what do you think about um, adding a project part on the Angular GitHub uh, for such stuff? So like uh, setting up meetups about discussions like that, or projects we are doing that we formalize it more and. Yeah, no, uh, love that. So we, uh, just to share a little bit of history, we actually created a, a whole web app. Actually, Jules was the one that built it. Um, it was called Project Houston, where we had this idea of missions that like, if there were good things the community could do to come together, we wanted to help facilitate that. Um, and so that, that was all Jules' creation. We never actually shipped the app. We, we've rebuilt it three or four times now and, and never shipped it. Um, but yes, we want to do that. And if someone can help us make that happen, that would be great because uh, I just, I think as a team, we, we've got so much on our plate that we want to run these things and we think they're super valuable. We just haven't had the bandwidth to do so. Maybe uh, the first, uh, the easiest thing would be you are, have a, Git, a GitHub project and you have, uh, th there you can uh, just use GitHub. Um, so don't create an app uh, on top, just use GitHub and GitHub uh, yeah, issues and whatever. What about so Robert GitHub just volunteered to create a Angular Missions GitHub repo? Maybe, yeah, maybe just do an Angular Missions uh, GitHub repo, yeah. Just on, on your uh, yeah. on your Angular uh, uh, team, uh, Robert. Uh, Angular you Angular. should do it. You, no, I'm, I'm, you I'm delegating. Robert. Robert, you just signed up. <laughs> no, Have no, we considered for opening sure, up? For sure, can, for sure, I can. For sure, I can do it. But the thing is, um, uh, you have an Angular organization there, and uh, it's uh, better when you centralize stuff and not put it uh, some, uh, on some sites. I would love to support you, but uh, I, uh, the uh, where you can go on it, I would uh, just uh, use the Angular organization. I, get that. I mean, like, I, I know it would be better in the Angular organization, but I will also say, if if we do it, we are going to hold you back. We, we are going to be less effective at this than you will. And so, uh, to me, the, the best collaboration model is you do it and we point everybody to you. Okay, I will just think about it. <laughs> okay. How is the best thing? Okay. Uh, speaking of which, uh, I, I don't know, I jumped in, in the middle of all this, maybe we discussed this already in the beginning, but I'm talking about community and I would love to hear about um, the communities that you're managing, how they're doing now and everything is uh, going online. Do you have any tips for, for having engaging um, meetups and conferences? And you know that I'm particularly um, interested in, in diversity and how to help NG girls uh, within that. I've had a, a very hard time in the past few months to join online uh, um, events. And, and this one is, is really important for me, um, but I'd love to see how everybody else is doing it and, and think that would help even me. So maybe we can also have a, a, another meeting um, for just, you know, talking about your communities and, and ideas, just popping up ideas for, you know, engage, increasing the engagement, maybe tools that you've been using, comparing them, stuff like that. Is, is Maxim still on the call? Because in, in my head, one possible avenue for that would be Angular Community, which is, is like, totally. I can never find it when I Google it, but there there is a, this meta group for community organizers and community like organizing leads that I, yeah, I would love that to be. There is a Slack channel for that. Can you paste the, the link to that or can we, because I, I think there is that channel and I think if we just get everyone in the right channel and get it active and get people connected, that would be super valuable. So I'm not on the computer right now. So if someone can add it to the doc and uh, so that we can maybe combine both because um, this meeting is really a, a good time for me to think about it and to like have the idea to actually go ahead and have a meeting for that. 
and then we'll add Maxim to the loop and um, everybody else who wants to join. What do you think? That sounds awesome. Yeah, so uh, Sander, will you put the link in the in the doc when you get a chance? Yeah, Thanks. it is Got in. It. The, the name is in. It, it, the... I, I, put it, I put it down in the community chat section here with uh, awesome. Awesome, great. So I'll talk to him and, and we'll add a date and everything. Yeah. Awesome. Aren't you in there? Uh, do we have any more uh, final topics? It, it looks like there, there's fewer and fewer people signing up for some of these chats. So maybe, maybe we close it here. Obviously, this is not the end of conversations. I, I really do love the Angular community that uh, everyone is constantly collaborating, coming up with new ideas. So definitely do not let us be blockers there. But if we can help be facilitators, that, that is wonderful. And we, we love right. being parts of all of these things. So uh, I'm really glad to see this. Um, uh, who's hosting? Oh, wait. Uh, Eunice, you're going to host the Creating Harnesses one, right? Okay, great. So you'll send out invites. I'll just add myself here so that I can attend if I'm available. Um, Emma, Mark, anything else that you want to call out before we, we close here? I got something. Um, what I would like to see... I do not have see, anything. What I would like to see is, uh, is a way to open up the tooling a little bit more so that you can... Um, use the CLI and the generators, but also use some tool like Snowpack or a different build tool or no build tool, just global up everything in one go without losing all the possibilities from the, C from the CLI, except from the bundling part, basically, and, and use something, some external toolings for, for packaging an Angular app. Sanders, you want to collaborate on some builders? Yeah, that's the right? <laughs> huh? Uh, I, I have IDs. <laughs> there is a ng X builders uh, GitHub repository for custom builders. It is very rich in examples, very good and well maintained. Oh, I was never aware of that. You should go there, and if you have an idea, you should add it there. It's a beautiful collection of custom builders. So have a look. Can, can you put a link? Michael? Yeah, I will do it now. Okay. I have a discussion topic. I don't know if, we, if we're trying to end this now, but I think we had some more time, don't we? Uh, I thought we were done. I guess we have 15 minutes left. Four, I thought we had 15. Left. I thought we were done at 45 after. Uh, I, I think some people are having to sign off now. Let me just double check my calendar here. I updated the event so we could go another 45 minutes from here. I mean, I know some people will have to drop, but they did extend it for open okay. discussion. I, I think let's let's go till one. So let's go another 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my question is based upon. Uh, Enterprise development, uh, ng-serve, a lot of people are seeing uh, significant slowdowns ever since turning on AOT, uh, especially with the dev uh, rebuild cycle. So, they, you know, they've seen their rebuild after making a single file change go from like two to four seconds with JIT to, you know, V9 going to 25 seconds with AOT, and now there's additional issues in uh, V11.1 where people are seeing, you know, 45 second uh, turnaround time in ng-serve. There's been a lot of performance improvements to this. Um, in, in V11, there was some real big performance improvements, but it was also offset by some other changes. Um, some of the stuff that I've seen people sort of give feedback around is that, you know, some of this is just Webpack, some of it's just Terse, or some of it's just Post CSS, some of it is just like, it's not even Angular, it's just building your project. Uh, and then another big piece, which is really valuable, I think people really want this value, but they don't want their dev time to go to 25 second rebuilds, is that template type checking and all the power of Ivy. 
it, it seems like at a certain point you get um, you get to a point where that that just it's valuable, but it just slows everything down. And 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 the comparisons I've seen is just like, yeah, AOT is slower for rebuilds because it's just doing more. It's giving you more value, giving you more power. Um, has anyone thought about how we we get that power, but we get the quick rebuilds? You know, can we get that information in our IDE? And whatnot, but yet not slow down uh, the rebuilds. Or is that just something like going forward we're always going to see with with AOT? The um, the one big thing that's going to completely revolutionise this is getting rid of NT modules. Because at the moment the problem we have is if you make a change in one template or one component, that then ripple effects all the way up to the NG module, which then triggers every component that's within that NG module and that's imported from that, that, N, that imports that NG module has to be recompiled because we've got no way of telling if that small change you made in that component will not impact on templates and, and the compilation of, of uh, components all over the app. And so it's really hard to um, do small incremental rebuilds um, because of the fact that everything is so interwoven with energy modules. So when we do finally get rid of them, you will be, we will be able to move to a much more um, incremental style of rebuild. I know that Yoast has been spending a huge amount of time on this over the last few months, and uh, you've probably seen his various comments in the, in the recent issues. Uh, some of it is stuff that we can try to improve. Um, Ironically, what's actually happened in the last minor release was that we found that we were not rebuilding correctly and that actually the applications that were being incrementally rebuilt were wrong. And so we fixed that, but then of course that then means that the build takes longer because we're having to build more, more things rebuilding. that, yeah. So, you know, you could go with some kind of crazy, let's just rebuild the least that we can and hope for the best just because it's dev mode and um, we want a quick turnaround on this particular page and we don't care about whether the app is actually working properly or not versus um, actually we need to make sure that you've changed something so therefore it's going to make an impact on lots of things and you need to make it right. So there, there potentially could be some heuristics I guess but and the bottom line is that it's, it's NG modules that are causing us to um, have to rebuild more than we would like to because that, that incrementality is, is impossible to achieve. Is there a module structure that would be recommended for this? I think Yuna said in, in their you know single component at, you know modules is is does that help or is there some other architectural style that would help minimize those issues? I, yeah, I think that the fewer things that you put in an NG module probably does help because what happens is that an ng module creates what's called a module scope and everything and every component that is declared within that scope is effectively a rebuild a single rebuild unit so if you change one component within that ng module then all the components with that within that ng module has to be reanalyzed um, do, so do i you... suspect that if you did go for smaller ng modules you would get slightly better incremental build time but then the overall build time might uh, increase do you, do you actually end up risking, like in a single file component world where we don't have modules, everything depends on everything else, and then you need to build the whole graph anyway? Like it actually makes it worse because people aren't using modules for like isolation of separate parts of their app? Well, you would still have to set up your dependencies between the components. Um, the difference would be that you would be able to specify this component really does depend upon these three components. Whereas at the moment you say this component is part of this big family of components and they might all have some interactions with each other but we can't tell unless we rebuild the whole ng module so, um, the so that's applied, the difference the same applies when each component has their uh is their in their own module and when you have a module with a collection of component modules uh would be this faster I mean, Lars, uh, Lars uh, has, uh, yeah, do some experimental with these things. Yeah, so if you're importing modules into other modules, then you're effectively moving the components from those 
imported modules into the scope of the ng module that you're um, importing into. So that would have a similar effect, I think. Okay. But but if you have um, ng modules that have components in them which are not exported from the ng module, so therefore the being imported into another ng module, they wouldn't be, be visible. Oh. Then if you were to change one of those so-called private components, that would not trigger an, a recompilation of the entire tree. So you can, by using ng modules, create an encapsulation of certain like private components within an ng module. But as soon as you export an, a component from a module, then that's effectively going to be uh, making it available to the rest of the world. So the reason of the recompilation of big chunks is directly related to templates. So we are talking about components here. Am I correct? Well, th there are aspects of components which impact on templates like inputs, mm -hmm. um, host bindings, all kinds of things which are not necessarily in the template, but they, they impact on the compilation of the template. So can we bring the compilation time of a module down by reducing the number of included components and just rearrange the import structure in a way that maybe through lazy loading and other techniques we could like have smaller pieces that need to get recompiled or faster? If you have um independent groups of ng modules which don't depend upon each other then they would never one a change in one ng module would never trigger the uh, comp recompilation of the stuff in the other totally separate ng module angular material is a good example for this i get i guess like the way they implemented their packages can we point there and say this is a good example on how you should do it i don't actually i haven't spent any time looking at those packages so maybe jeremy knows yeah. more about how they're implemented i know you moved um, to some smaller ng modules containing fewer things but i wasn't sure if that was from a performance point of view or whether it was just to, from a tree shaking point of view uh, well, you're probably I don't know. not listening to the conversation <laughs> <laughs> i was i was uh, partially listening um should i repeat for I... you in one sentence Sorry, say that again. Should I repeat the question for you, or should I just let you? I mean, go? It's just basically like how to how to have faster incremental build times, right? Um, and like ultimately, it depends on your build graph, right? That's going to be the thing that has the biggest impact, right? So if you make a change that is some dependent node in your build graph that a lot of other stuff has to recompile as a result of it, then those turnarounds are going to be slow. And so the best thing you can do to simplify your like build graph is to like work on granular chunks that aren't don't have a like don't work on things that are dependencies of like everything else in the application um like you're talking about lazy loading lazy, lazy loading is kind of orthogonal to like build performance right um if you are doing lazy loading kind of as a consequence of that you will be forced to build things that don't depend on other things as much and so those will build faster um if you're working on like leafs leaf like areas of your application where the dependencies don't have to be rebuilt every time, um, then that can also be faster. But it also depends on your build tool as well. Your build tool has to be smart enough to know that when your dependencies haven't changed, they don't need to be rebuilt. Um, that's why like tools like Bazel um, that we use for Angular are really nice because they are like eminently cacheable um, because like you have your you know basal target for you know your user profile page and as long as like none of your ui components common components have changed none of those need to be rebuilt and you're just rebuilding this one part of the application and that's what we do in google right so um whenever you go to build um your application code you don't have to like rebuild angular and all like angular components from scratch uh those are just cached um I don't actually know what the state of the ecosystem is in terms of like how smart like Webpack is for doing stuff like that. Someone else can probably answer that more. Um, but um, all that uh, that intelligence in the build system does come at a trade off, right? Because like using something like Bazel, despite it being very powerful like that, it also is like much more complicated, right? You it requires a lot more hands on management and configuration of your build system. 
in order to maintain those different build boundaries. So if it is the module dependency graph that I have to look in, is there a good tool that I should use that you would suggest me to use to analyze that in as much as detail as I can? I, I guess the NX dependency graph is not what you would use to analyze that. So I, I really talk about like performance audits and what tools, because I understand mm -hmm. the problem now, I can follow that stuff. Um, what tools can I use to analyze that and really be sure and nail it down to one particular import or that stuff? Yeah, I don't know. Minko, do you know of anything? I haven't necessarily seen anything. I think Minko had to step out. Oh, Minko's what, isn't there um, like a replacement for the, um, ow, ow, uh, how was it pronounced, the, the thing that, um, the plugin for the Chrome, which allowed you to show the, the kind of dependency graph of all of your components and services? It was called Aura Augury. or Augury. Isn't there like a replacement for that that's being built at the moment, which would demonstrate, which would show some of this? Uh, uh, for me, Augury never worked, and I'm pretty sure it's not supported. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but oh yeah, yeah, Augury is itself is not. But I, but I definitely saw maybe on our roadmap. Yeah, that... I, yeah I can talk about that. Um, Minko can talk about it a lot better, probably. Uh, there is a replacement to Augury that is a joint project with Wrangle, um, which is the owner of Augury. So a lot of it is actually the same features ported over from Augury with a specific focus on um, building out some of the requested features. So we talked a little bit about like detecting, uh, it, early in this meeting we were talking about the differences of like running change detection and seeing the profiling of like how long each change detection cycle took and things like that. So there's profiling features and some stuff like that. Um, and I see in the chat that there was some discussion about having a, a chat about dev tools. So maybe that's a good place to sort of talk about that. Wait, I think DevTools isn't public yet. Like, not everybody can use it, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the plan is for it to be public sometime this year, is what I've heard. Um, a lot of that, again, depends on something else we talked about today, which was those uh, debugging APIs. Um, but so, even um, though it's not public, oh, go ahead. No, uh, I was just going to say, uh, Michael Prentice, you, you kind of started this conversation about performance of build, but it, it got deeply connected into this idea of standalone components and optional modules. Um, do, do you think we could combine those conversations, or do you think they're distinct? If those are the same conversation, I think it would be great. I think we're going to want to have some of the CLI tooling people there, as well as maybe Alex and some of the other people that and Pete that are involved in, in the Ivy side of things. But yeah, if that's all the same discussion, I think it's a discussion we need to have. Um, on the topic of a, a, a dependency graph, I know there's something with CompoDoc, but on bigger projects I've seen that it blows up. So I don't know that we have a good tooling option there at the moment. Awesome. But, uh, yeah, um, if you want to... Put, uh, yeah, so Michael Prentice, down. sign up for the standalone components and optional modules. Uh, Lars is actually running that one. Okay. Um, and then Pete, I don't know if you or if anyone, if we can get anyone from the tooling team to attend and share thoughts and listen to ideas. I'll, I'll add myself and I'm sure there'll be some of the others will be interested. Awesome. All right. Um, as I said, I, we've had a lot of people drop off, so I want to just kind of uh, end on a, a strong note. I feel like we've got a document now with a bunch of follow-up meeting, so I'm feeling actually really good that we're going to continue some of these conversations and keep uh, listening, keep having really kind of good ideas, like Angular is built on the really good ideas. Of the Thank you for everyone that's just attending and listening in. Uh, I, I love these things. I, I remember back, like, was it four years ago now to the, the first one of these we did in Salt Lake City and just the, the power and the sophistication of the conversations we have around the ideas that everyone has and the, the things that they're trying out, it, it always blows me away. Like. I came into this with relatively low expectations, and I, I've just been like astonished by all the cool things that people are doing. So, uh, thank you everyone for attending, and uh, we've got some great follow-ups, and we're always around. So let's let's do this again soon. See you. Bye everybody. Bye.
Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.